Okay, and we are now live on YouTube. Okay, great, thank you. All right, welcome to the afternoon session of the Landmarks Preservation Commission's public hearing of February 8th, 2022. This uh, meeting is being held via Zoom and live streamed on YouTube. So if you would like to testify on any items this afternoon, please join the meeting at the estimated time shown on our agenda. Please note we are um, a little behind schedule at this point. And if you'd like to just watch the proceedings, you may do so at our YouTube channel. And we are going to begin the afternoon session with item number seven, and I will turn it over to Corey Harala, our Director of Preservation, to take us through the rest of the agenda today. Okay, thank you, Sarah. We'll uh, go ahead and read in public hearing item number seven, LPC 22-06084, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 1378, lot 113. 21 East 63rd Street in the Upper East Side Historic District. This is a Beaux-Arts style row house built in 1900 and designed by Buckman and Fox and altered in 1980. The application is to remove the stoop, alter the ground floor and modify the areaway walls and ironwork. Okay, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. I am giving the presentation over. I'm sorry, I'm afraid not all of them have entered the hearing. Abby, um, Cass did join recently and I promoted to panelists, so should be showing up momentarily. Yeah. I don't see him. I don't see him as a panelist. Ah, oh, there he is. Okay, you now have control of the presentation. You just need to click on your screen, unmute yourself, state your name for the record, and you may begin when ready. Hi, everybody at Cast Ackerberg. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yes, we can. Yes. Thank okay. you. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to get my camera to turn on, but I can't seem to uh, get to that place. So, anyway, apologies for the delay. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Cast Ackerberg of Higgins Quays Barth and Partners, um, joined with uh, Vincent Icabellis of Design Republic, principal at Design Republic, who's working with me um, uh, on the project here at 21 East. 63rd Street. Um, the building, um, as, uh, as Corey mentioned, uh, is a uh, 1900 uh, row house, uh, sort of townhouse style building on the north side of 63rd Street, uh, located between Madison and uh, Madison and Fifth Avenue. It's a 25 foot wide um, townhouse uh, located in the Upper East Side Historic District. And the project that we um, are presenting to you today really is focused uh, on changes just at the base of the building. Uh, and there are two modifications that need to be made that are code required. One is uh, providing an at grade uh, entry to the building uh, to provide accessibility that uh, direct uh, discharge uh, compliant exiting from the uh, from the upper floors of the building. Um, and so we'll be taking you through a series of modifications uh, at the base of the building. And as you'll see, uh, the base of this building, while it, it may not seem obvious in this photograph, has, has seen remarkable change uh, over uh, over the 20th century. So we'll take you um, now through uh, through that series of changes first. So a series of photographs, first uh, a photo from 1910 that illustrates the uh, facade as it was designed by Buckman and Fox uh, in 1900. Uh, it was an 1884 row house that had been redone like many of its neighbors uh, at the turn of the century. So the two uh, photos on the left side of the slide uh, from 1910 and the text photo from 1940 show that historically there was an entry uh, on the far right or eastern bay of the three bay wide building with a projecting canopy uh, and one over one double hung windows uh, adjacent to the middle and left bay. You can see those here in the text photo. Um, the building was converted to commercial use in the 1940s 
And um, just before designation, the base of the building was significantly altered. And you can see that in the uh, photos uh, on the right side of the slide. So the black and white photo from the time of designation, and then another photo from your own uh, collection uh, in color. And I have a more detailed view of this in just a moment. But you can see that basically, from the, the bracket supporting the second floor balcony down, everything was replaced uh, in around uh, 1980, just, uh, just prior to designation. Um, the proposal that we're uh, presenting today um, does a couple things. And one, uh, as I said, is, is really addressing the code compliant issues and providing uh, accessibility first and foremost for an at grade entry. And then, um, and that's obviously at the center bay. And then uh, on the eastern bay and the rightmost bay, providing an egress door to provide code compliant exiting. Um, from the upper floors of the building. And, um, you know, one thing that is, you know, a challenge going into this is sort of managing between providing sort of at grade entries and negotiating between the proportion and coming up with a solution that we feel uh, feels right for the building. Um, obviously, all the modifications are happening to materials that, uh, that date to the 1990s, uh, but providing um, co-compliant um, access at the, at the building, but doing it in a way that feels sort of uh, appropriate for uh, for a building of this age and style in the district, and also speaks to a new use of in commercial since the 1940s. Will now have uh, a retail tenant at the first floor. La Ligue is um, going to occupy the first floor. So we need to sort of signify that new entry with, and that new use through a little bit more transparency at the base of the building. So we'll take you through um, a bit of the existing conditions. Again, uh, a, an overall view of the base of the building um, as it appears today. Um, again, all the material basically from this datum down dates to the 1990s. There's uh, granite, uh, granite steps, and you'll see this is a very thin dimension granite, which will be replaced. It's not holding up well. Uh, limestone uh, across uh, the facade, which for the most part we will be maintaining and just lowering these openings, which also dates to the 90s a modification, uh, which will be retained. Um, a, a transom above that also to be retained in the, in the um, flagpoles and masonry uh, beyond. Uh, again, a detailed view of the sort of progression illustrating the degree of change that's occurred at the base of the building. So the 1940s tax photo, again, showing the, the entry in the easternmost bay and the double hung windows to the, to the west, uh, the, the photograph of the building as it looked at the time of designation, and then the current photo um, as it is uh, today. Some other details um, of the upper portions of the facade. Uh, up at the um, uh, up at the uh, brackets and the cartouches between the brackets, uh, and then the entry. Uh, all the ironwork again is from the 1990s, uh, as is the limestone. Uh, you can see the railing of the two sort of planted areas of the areaway on either side of the steps, and then looking at the condition of the sidewalk and the areaways, you can see the the steps, uh, the treads in particular are very thin dimension. They're cracking and they're broken off. Uh, we'll be replacing those with a, a deer aisle granite of much significant, more significant dimension, so they they don't fracture as as the existing has. Um, an existing photo on the left and a rendered view on the right. Um, again, the idea is obviously to provide code compliant um, entry and exiting to the building, to also signify the new use at the base of the building, but to do it in a way that feels appropriate um, for a building of this style and age uh, in the Upper East Side Historic District. Um, looking at the district, and we wanted to look at a couple um, a couple different um, things, particularly, and I'll go back one slide, um, addressing uh, the, the increased height of these bays in particular, and also the center bay, and how that's managed, let's say, in other buildings in the district. Because one of the things we saw immediately is that from the existing um, the existing openings with the the, the keys here, the splay lintel down to the sidewalk is actually quite high. And we didn't want to have just one tall or two tall, very tall uh, openings here. So one of the things that we saw in the district is that in other, space, in other buildings where there are these large scale openings um, at, the, at the first level, there's a, often an intermediate course of limestone uh, introduced between maybe a clear story and a, and a, and a window or a transom in a window to provide a little bit of scale and differentiation so that the proportion, which otherwise would be quite tall and narrow, is sort of mitigated by the introduction of, <clears throat> excuse me, of this horizontal limestone band. So that's something that we've accommodated in our design. And we also wanted to look at um, 
uh, how ground floors were treated, particularly where there are historically at grade entries. And this is something that one sees throughout the district. Um, you know, these two buildings here on the left side of the slide, sort of very large scale openings at the base of the building. Um, these happen to have sort of arched openings, uh, but large scale openings that come right down to, to the sidewalk grade. Also seeing how the coursing is, is designed with a limestone that then comes down to a simple uh, granite, uh, granite water table as we're proposing. Um, these two slides here on the right side, this obviously is not quite an at grade entry, but you can see the sort of very large scale at the base of this building. This is a slightly different um, arrangement than the previous slide, but again, introducing of a horizontal limestone band to sort of mitigate the, the overall scale of these larger scale openings. Uh, and then this photo on the right, slightly smaller scale, but again, a series of sort of at grade entries, um, both for, for service and for, uh, for a main entry. So at grade entries is something actually one sees, obviously, you know, you're familiar with buildings with stoops, also the sort of later um, converted redone facades where there's a, a, a lower entry uh, into the building, but there are uh, a number of at grade entries throughout the Upper East Side Historic District. So returning back to our proposal, this is an existing elevation, building elevation on the left, uh, proposed without awnings, and then proposed with awnings. We're proposing fabric awnings um, at the two outer bays. Um, and you'll see, I think interestingly, is that the, the way that um, the building was originally designed, uh, as Bruce Price designed, um, sorry, Buckman and Fox designed the, the upper floors, they were detailed with one over one windows. And so the, the, the sort of texture of the facade is given through the use of very um, richly carved limestone, but the fenestration uh, is just a simple one over one, unlike some of the other Beaux-Arts classically designed buildings even directly to the west that have a much more ornate sort of multi-light configuration for the window. So we thought um, this arrangement at the base of the building uh, was appropriate given the sort of transparency that exists on the upper floors. Um, turning to, to the plan, uh, this is sort of largely what's driving um, changes at the entry and also to the bay to the to the to the east. So this is an existing ground floor plan uh, and detail plan, and then proposed and detail plan. And so what you can see is that there are the the initial set of steps coming up from the sidewalk. One comes in through the existing doors, and then there are another set of steps uh, just inside. And so the the differential between the the first floor level and the sidewalk is over six feet. Um, there's also currently an open stair that it, that comes from the cellar up into the entry, and there's a need to actually separate that and have that stair be its own, have its own uh, exiting directly to the street. So the proposal uh, in a detailed plan is to come in uh, at grade um, into this uh, into this landing, this sort of lower level. Um, there will be steps rising right up into the main retail space with a lift uh, that will take. Um, visitors from that lower level right up to the first floor and then the main uh, the main lift for the building is of course at that upper level and then to the right in the detail plan this is a stair that comes up from the cellar and is tied in with the overall uh exiting and egress from the upper floors that comes up and then uh, discharges directly out of the building um separate and apart from the access from the from the retail so these are these are the code code require Modifications uh, that are that are needed to bring the building uh, up to uh, to current code for its for its new uses and what drives these modifications that we're proposing. So an existing elevation, uh, you've seen this in photos, an elevation, um, and then a proposed elevation, um, just indicating the way we're trying to maintain some of the texture through ironwork up at this uh, clear story window, sort of an enlarged. Uh, elevation, it gets a little muddy in these slides, but you can see that in a large elevation to provide some texture and uh, and scale for, for some of those openings. Same for the transom above the doors. Uh, this this window, this will serve as a, as a basic a show window. Uh, this will serve as the exiting door from that cellar stair. Um, there's very simple signage, um, three inch uh, brass letters on a painted metal uh, panel on either side um, uh, with the word Lali for the new tenant. And then of course, uh, as well up on uh, the canopy, a very small two inch uh, dimensional letters uh, applied onto the front of that canopy. Uh, we're, we will be modifying, the, there's a bullnose right now. Um, I'll go back to the existing elevation at this elevation that serves almost like a fill course. Um, because we're lowering these openings, um, we will eliminate that because it just doesn't have any relation to the opening. So the Ashler limestone will carry down to a new, um, a new granite water table. 
Um, I'll also just point out that the doors, um, we are proposing a, a single uh, swing door here and a, an operable side light. Uh, this opening currently is only five foot 10 inches in width. So while we would have preferred to have symmetrically open uh, symmetrical doors, there isn't uh, the width to accommodate a uh, code compliant door that allows for a 32 inch open clearance for uh, ADA accessibility. So we have um, a code compliant door here and then an operable side light, which will allow for movement of um, larger items, furniture and things like that. And then the operable um, exiting door here, which will come allow for someone exiting through the door through the um, through the the areaway and then a gate um, here uh, in front out onto the sidewalk. Um, comparable elevations of the existing and proposed. Um, I think you you understand the scope. Um, what we've attempted to do is sort of balance the the desire of having some texture and quality and sort of fine scale to the elevation, but also to accommodate the need for the accessibility in a way. Um, that I think is fitting within the district. Um, as I mentioned, we are proposing awnings, so we have one elevation without the awning, so you can see the transom above the uh, the window and door, uh, and just simple fabric awnings uh, over those openings to provide a little bit of depth to the facade. Um, comparable sections, this is at the westernmost bay where the window is located, uh, where we will be lowering that uh, to provide some visibility into that uh, entry area um, with, with a section through the canopy. Uh, this is an existing section through the main entry. So again, this is the six foot differential from sidewalk to first floor. Um, presently, you come up a series of steps outside, go to a, a landing and then another set of steps. And the proposal will, will include both steps uh, directly up to the first floor as well as a lift that you saw in plan directly behind uh, this, uh, this enclosure. Uh, and then a section through uh, the egress uh, exiting path um, on, the, um, on the easternmost bay, again, the high sill for the window uh, coming down to grade to allow for exiting directly out, uh, outside. Um, section details of the existing windows and um, the proposed window section, illustrating the depth of the, uh, the windows and the opening, uh, the integration of the ironwork uh, and the windows. Similarly, uh, section through the door, uh, this sort of substantial header that divides the, um, the transom with the ironwork above, uh, and then the doors, uh, the doors below, and then uh, similar detail through the uh, through the exiting door in the easternmost bay. Um, the section here, uh, ironwork at the at the areaways with a, a granite uh, curb um, supporting the ironwork, and then a detailed section for the awning. This is a just a fabric awning. It will be framed uh, with a, a loose skirt uh, with a weighted flap at the bottom, consistent with um, with the, the staff rules for for awning installations. The signage I mentioned, we were proposing two plaques. Uh, the signage is three inches uh, tall on either side of the entry, uh, and then a two and a quarter inch letter uh, above the entry in the um, uh, on the front fascia of the uh, of the canopy. Um, door details again. I mentioned um, why we have to have uh, a door and a separate side light. Um, we looked at doing a, a center door with two side lights, but given the narrowness of the opening. The side lights would basically just all be framed and no no mace uh, and no glazing. So we thought this was the the the, the best solution. We are integrating some ironwork uh, into the the outer portion of the glazing area to give uh, to give those doors a bit of texture and to tie them into the ironwork found elsewhere uh, at the base of the building. Uh, and then similarly, some of the same detailing across the areaway uh, with the gate uh, at the uh, at the easternmost bay. And then finally, um, a rendering. Here, I think first and foremost, acknowledging that you know all the work uh, that is at the base, all the existing material at the base of the building, and where the work is being done is occurring, uh, it's in, in non-historic material, um, and that the changes that we're proposing are consistent with treatments for either at-grade entries or these large, narrow openings seen elsewhere uh, in the historic district. And I think um, the proposal that we've come up with is a is a good balance between um, and an appropriate balance between uh, providing some new transparency and views into the space um, in a way that sort of signals the, the new use for the building, but does it in a way that balances the, the, the scale giving and textural uh, features that one sees um, elsewhere in the district. And then finally, um, a, a slide just with our uh, materials, um, Indiana limestone for the base where we're modifying uh, the, the openings at the base, uh, gray Deer Isle granite, uh, black painted ironwork and a, and a gray fabric awning. 
Um, and with that, um, we'll be happy to uh, answer any questions you may have. Great, thank you very much. Commissioners, do we have any questions? Yes, Commissioner Jefferson, please go ahead. The, the, the automated, the doors, the handicap doors, are they automated? Yes. So they, if you uh, they are not, they are not automated. Okay. They are not, they don't, they don't need to, but yep. Okay. Okay. Other questions. All right. I don't see any other questions at this moment. So we'll move to public testimony and we may have more questions afterwards. If you're in the meeting and would like to testify on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Sasha Seeley to take us through the testimony. Thank you. So I do have my first sign up, Lara Varielli from Friends of the Upper East Side. Lara, you should be receiving a request from me. Okay, I see that you are in the meet meeting. Please state your name for the record. You have three minutes to speak. Hi, um, Lara Varielli representing Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts. Chair Carroll and Honorable Commissioners. The proposed alterations to the main floor of this turn of the century Bozar structure lay the groundwork for an interesting conversation about the appropriateness of significant design changes in buildings that have been altered in the past and restored in recent years. Additionally, we applaud the applicant for having taken into consideration the feedback received at the community board. Friends Preservation Committee appreciates the challenges the applicant has been presented with, given the existing configuration of the building's interior plan and main facade proportions. The increased transparency of the street level openings reduces the level of detail and texture of the building. We understand, however, the desire to create a more welcoming sense based on the structure's commercial use and believe the applicant has come up with a sensible plan that balances ironwork detail and transparency. Friends is concerned about the odd proportions and lack of symmetry of the main entrance. The additional three feet in high due to the stoop removal create an incongruous appearance. We wonder if the intermediate course of limestone proposed for the side openings were to be replicated at the door replacing the black metal spindle separating the door and transom, the overall appearance of the central bay would be more harmonious and more in keeping with the building's design. Finally, we appreciate the muted appearance of the proposed signage. However, we believe that the potential overall signage to be excessive for a residential street in case the tenant decides to make use of the two existing flagpoles. Given the fact that this commission does not regulate the content and size of flags, we ask that, we ask that the existing flagpoles are taken into consideration when analyzing the entire signage of this building. Thank you. All right, thank you. Next, I have, just hold up, I have Michelle Arbelou from Historic wow. District Council. Michelle, you should be receiving a request from me. Okay, Michelle, I see that you are in the meeting. Please state your name, um, turn on your mic. You have three minutes to speak. Hello, Michelle Arblue for the Historic Districts Council. HDC finds this proposal to be generally acceptable given the alterations to which the building has previously been, been subjected. We ask that the commission to have the applicant work with the staff to develop a more symmetrical front door solution. Perhaps a single door with an iron side light could be considered well in keeping with the, um, the ADA compliance. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, taking a glance over, I had John Graham signed up for Victorian Society, but do not see John in the meeting. Okay, all right. Okay, I will call on George Calderaro. Okay, George, you should be receiving a request from me. All right, George, please turn on your mic and state your name for the record. You have three minutes. <clears throat> We're having some, hold on. Hi, uh, sorry, I guess John had technical issues 
today too, so I'll read the testimony he was going to read. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioners George Calderaro for the Victorian Society, um, New York. Uh, John had said, reviewing this application was both a pleasant walk down memory lane and a distressing look at an insensitive proposal. The pleasure came from the fact that I, I being John Graham, was the staff person who brought forward the proposal to remove the 1980s cladding from the ground floor in place when the building was used by the management team of Diana Ross and to install the well-integrated material the applicants are proposing to alter. The distressing part is that the applicants are asking to modify a balanced unified facade which closely resembles mansions of the period and which has window openings aligning with the original parlor floor level, symmetrical pair doors, and a single transom over the entrance. The proposal would rip off the nicely weathered limestone cladding and bullnose sills, elongate the western window to, to a bizarre degree, install asymmetrical entrance doors, and scatter a total of four transoms across the facade like raisins in a cookie. These actions would take the facade farther away from its original design and diminish the building, the street, and the Upper East Side historic district. Uh, commissioners, on drawing 15, the applicants propose signage, quote, for a future tenant. The applicants don't seem to know if the building is to be used for retail space or office space. If it is used for office space, we question the necessity of having on-grade access, a decision which seems to drive this destructive work. If the proposed use actually requires wheelchair accessibility, we recommend that the existing stoop be modified to accept one of the ex excellent wheelchair lifts we saw approved for the Bruce Price building on West 21st Street on November 11th, or the Northern Dispensary on Waverly Place on January 11th, and add automatic door openers to the symmetrical doors. This would allow the rest of the facade to remain in place. Better yet, if the curved railings cannot accept a lift, restore the original straight stoop shown in the historic tax photo, modified to accept a lift, without automatic door openers at the double doored entrance and recreate the original central window. This would move the proposal from an act of destruction into actual historic restoration. Thank you on behalf of John Graham. All right, thank you. Let me take a glance back over. Um, and I do not see any more hands raised, so I will hand it back over to you, Chair Carroll. I'll just note for the record that we did receive a resolution from Manhattan Community Board 8 recommending approval of the application. Um, okay, so now I'll turn back to Cass uh, and ask if you'd like to respond to any of the comments we've heard. I would thank you, uh, Chair Carroll. I, I, I always find it fascinating when what I see as a relatively modest project um, attracts so much attention. Um, and also, uh, you know, to the description of the sort of wanton destruction. Um, I, I think, you know, first and foremost, I'll say that the proposal here, I, I think is fairly considered and it takes into account um, both the historic commercial use of this building, but also its, its new life as having retail use, which is not uncommon for buildings um, uh, on the side streets of, uh, of, of the Upper East Side, particularly those in close proximity to Madison Avenue, as this is. This is one building in from, from, uh, from Madison. So first and foremost, I think sort of in terms of, you know, I think there's a discussion about signage. During, I'll note that during the course of uh, the application, La Leak signed a lease. So I apologize for there being a note that says for a future tenant, that tenant is La Leak now because the lease has been signed. So the base is going to be used for retail purposes. And I think, you know, three and two inch letters uh, on discrete plaques uh, aligned with the, the coursing of the limestone, I think is quite appropriate um, for a retail uh, user that is off of Madison Avenue. I think it is possible that they will put a flagpole up on the existing flagpoles. And I think uh, combining those two things uh, it doesn't really represent an excessive amount of signage for, uh, for the building. Um, you know, in terms of the modifications at the entry, um, again, the, the, the work that was done in the 1980s did not result in the building being accessible. Um, there was an opportunity to provide an upgrade entry then or, or a lift, but that wasn't done. So um, this suggestion that um, you know, the doors be maintained and we add a, a, a rail lift 
to the existing steps that are falling apart, uh, that wouldn't even result in a code compliant condition because the opening, uh, the, the leaves themselves are not wide enough. So you'd have two doors, I suppose you could have two doors that open, uh, but that would be out over a landing. So you'd end up with a condition that isn't code compliant. So really in order to make this building uh, accessible, you need one door at least that results in a 32 inch clear opening. So, um, you know, the asymmetry is a, a condition that one sees um, in other parts, you know, in other historic buildings when the width of the openings uh, doesn't accommodate equal, equal doors. So uh, it is, you know, it, it is not the best, uh, it's not the best part of, um, you know, this, this design, but it is a sort of reality and there, there really is no opportunity to do you know, a large door and side lights. And doing a fixed panel, as was suggested, a fixed metal panel, I think would result in, uh, you know, an elevation that would be dark and sort of looming in a way that uh, wasn't there historically, isn't there uh, in the proposed condition, and I think, you know, certainly uh, isn't there in the existing condition. So I think, um, you know, the solution that we've come up with integrates um, some detailing to those doors. Uh, and I think in the overall uh, treatment of the base of the building, uh, one could find that appropriate because it is providing accessibility in a way that sort of accommodates the narrowness um, of that opening. Um, I'll just take a look at some of the notes that were also mentioned. Um, finally, I'll, I'll just say the community board in our discussion, um, there was a, a comments about the transparency at the entry. These, these doors are the only doors or the only sort of the only opening that provide daylight into the retail space because the door on the right provides access to, um, to the stair and on the left, there's the lift that brings people up to the first level. So, so having, having the daylighting of those doors and the transom above is very important because it's really the only source of daylight uh, that gets into the interior. So I think together, um, you know, it's, a, it's a good balance between uh, taking into account obviously the code requirements, but also providing uh, daylighting uh, and accessibility for, for the building as it moves into this next chapter uh, of its life. And so um, we hope uh, that you'll find that these modifications are appropriate. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, do you have any final questions? Okay, I don't see any others. I, I just did wanna just pursue one thought one, uh, one more time. The idea of doing a lift on these stairs wouldn't also, I think, work not just because of the doors, but do you not have an, a landing either, right? There's a landing, but the doors would have to swing out, I believe. And Vincent, maybe you could speak to the Correct. challenge of, of the, you know, the, accommodating that, but. Correct, the, the, there's two things, the, the operational aspect of a lift in its park position, the, uh, the motions of it um, uh, when engaged on how it reaches the top landing and the uh, not having the clearance, uh, the existing doors do not comply. The existing doors are approximately four inches thick, um, given the height and the structure of the door. It, it, they would have to be re replaced regardless, um, but uh, we felt that the more appropriate approach would be an at-grade entry point. Uh, the, the, uh, whenever we, we're challenged with um, utilizing lifts, there's always the operational aspect and the mechanical aspect of malfunction. This is just a, a very appropriate um, and very considerate um, uh, design to the existing conditions. Okay, great. And, and both the entrance doors and the egress doors need to be, need to meet code, accessibility Correct. code. Okay. All right, so commissioners, I'm gonna to start to send you requests to unmute you so we can close the hearing and begin our discussion. So please look for those. Okay, and Commissioner Bland, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Commissioner Lutfi, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so we'll begin our discussion. So as has been presented, the uh, base of the building um, is a fabric that dates to 1994. Uh, the building had been previously altered at the time of designation. And um, the application here is to address accessibility um, as well as the installation of three signs. And um, 
the accessibility changes include dropping the windows to create at grade doors and removing the stoop. Um, so let's begin our discussion. Commissioner Gustafson, would you like to start this one? Um, I, have, I have a strong feeling that uh, um, there's gonna be a lot more um, suggestions and critiques beyond me. Um, I, 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 saw, I think the problem here is that the, what they did the first time around set too high a standard. Um, and if we had um, simply moved from what it used to be um, years ago to the proposal, we'd be, uh, we wouldn't be debating so much. Um, I, I, honestly, I don't really have terribly much of a problem with the um, uh, with this current version. There is something about the proportions of the um, of the window and the door on either side that's a little unusual, and I don't know how to solve that. Um, um, but I, I don't. I, I think, generally speaking, this is appropriate. Okay, great. Thanks, Commissioner Shamir Barron. Yes, um, I, I think that when. I've been kind of really looking at the historic photograph of the, of the original and trying to see if there's any way to um, sort of return to its dimensions, the dimensions of the windows and the door. But it seems to me that those are, are not, um, there, there are not widths, that is that the, the actual center door or if it were a side door would not be sufficiently wide for um, it, it, if it preserved the dimensions of the historic version would not be sufficiently wide for today's um, requirement to suit today's requirements. So, uh, and then, and, and so when I look at, at the proposal, I mean, uh, all of the things that have been done sort of seem to make sense um, as in, in, in that they respond to the needs of the current program and the change in use and the relationship to the, the, you know, the fact that the fabric that we know see today is, is not a historic fabric. So, you know, there is something, as John said, that it that is a little bit awkward about the resulting dimensions. That is, that that openings that should have been windows are now sort of door-like, but are a little bit but are a little bit thin, and then that the, the center element is a little bit wide and asymmetrical. So everything's just a slightly off, but I don't think it is inappropriate given what sort of what we were handed, what they were handed and what they need to do with it. So I think I can approve it as proposed. I might have them rethink a little bit um, the, um, the grill, uh, where the grills happen in the, in the small, um, kind of in the small lunette kind of windows and maybe consider more grill elements on the front, front, front doors that kind of may camouflage a bit the asymmetry, if possible at all. But otherwise, I think it's um, it's a, it's appropriate. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Holford Smith. Yes, I agree. Um, I think it's too much has changed in the building, and codes have changed to try to bring it back to what it was originally. Um, so I think in we're sort of comparing it to the 1980s version. Um, I think they've done a pretty good job of trying to make it accessible, make it code compliant. Um, I, I agree that, that that center door is very big. Um, and I wonder if, if it might be a good suggestion to, to bring the limestone across as a transom instead of the metal. Um, but maybe that's something they can, they can work with staff. But I think overall it's, it's appropriate. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chapin. Yeah, uh, because this is an original material, um, I can look at, um, you know, seeing these uh, substantial changes to deal with <clears throat> a problem that we, you know, a, an issue, a need that we see very often. Um, I think that uh, the only thing that I see that maybe needs some, uh, you know, some revision is that if the, I think the fact that there are two transoms on each side is awkward and maybe just removing the transom from the windows, <clears throat> especially since if you're gonna have the, uh, what do you call it, the awnings in place quite a bit of the time, uh, you know, 
transom wouldn't be visible anyway, but I also just think it, it would improve the um, relationship and possibly there's something, it's unfortunate that the door has to be divided as it is, but it doesn't, there doesn't seem to be much alternative to that. As Commissioner Alfred Smith suggested, perhaps there's some way to shorten the door a little bit. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, the appearance of the door on the uh, the the center door, but otherwise, um, you know, I think the changes are being made for a purpose, and uh, that um, they've tried to create a a design that, that can appear appropriate, uh, although it is not uh, the original uh, design. So, so I, I think I can approve it. And there would be a couple of suggestions as I, those that I made. Commissioner Goldblum. Thank you. Um, I think that um, John Graham's uh, 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 general direction is a good one to think about. And here we have a non-historic base that is historicist in design. It's not a modern design. It's not meant to contrast with the building above. It's meant to suggest a history, which is fine. Um, and, but I think when you're, when you're doing that, you have to really look at it from the vantage point of, is it restorative or is it imaginative and, you know, doing something else. And I think that in this case, I would try to be guided by um, restorative historicist decisions as opposed to non-restorative ones or recreative ones, let's say. Um, and for me, that translates mostly into the base. If you notice in the proposed, the base drops out. Um, Whereas in both the original and in the um, reconstruction, the base is fairly high. Uh, and there's certainly plenty of precedent for having on grade doors that cut through a base. But I think that the loss of that datum is a loss of a historic reference to the original design that is unfortunate. Um, I don't think one need change the design of the doors or the windows uh, within that, but I think that the base detail should be retained or modified in such a way that it is more or less restorative of the original design intent. Um, I also agree with Adi, the grills are what screw up these, uh, these openings. The new grills are too open on the bottom and too tight on the top. And if they look at the current design um, or even the historical one in the lunette of the, over the central door, I assume that's historical, um, there's a, a, a solid to void ratio and balance and scale that's missing in the proposed. And I think that like she said, if there, were, there was additional density to the wrought iron on the main doors and, uh, uh, and on the side doors, it wouldn't have the glaring modernity and kind of starkness that it does now. And the transoms would lose their raisin-like quality. Okay. So, you, and you're talking about the refining the proportions of the proposed grills. In those right, the wrought iron, the wrought iron wood. Okay. Correct. Commissioner Devonshire. Sorry, sir. But the only problem I had with it has to do with the grill work as well. And I think Adi mentioned only the center door, but I think the two flanking doors uh, should have grill work on them as well. Okay. Commissioner Chen. I agree with, um, you know, as has been mentioned before, I think um, so much has changed, and I think the uh, given the uh, asymmetry on the center door, that's unavoidable at this moment, unless somebody else can come up with another uh, creative solution. But I sort of agree with uh, Commissioner John Gustafson's uh, thing. I can't picture what it is, but I think on the lower transom, 
something is odd about you know the lower right hand corner and i don't want to play designer but given there's been so much uh, comment about to make some modified design but if there's something that can work for staff to uh, uh you know uh, it's also in the staff comment as well okay commissioner bland um yeah, I'm trying to trying to think why I why I don't like it the way it is. Um, I've listened carefully to the other commissioners, but I I find that uh, given the constraints of of what uh, they have to deal with in terms of code, <clears throat> uh, except going back to that um, before the uh, recherche. Uh, uh, you know, addition here, back to a big open modern uh, opening, um, which I don't think would be appropriate. Uh, this is this is kind of fine the way it is. I don't really have any objection to any of it. Okay, Commissioner Lutfi. So <clears throat> this is one of those like sort of imperfect projects <laughs> where. Um, you know, there's just these little things about it that you uh, you just sort of wish to change, like like the proportions in the door. You want the store to either have a a center that's uh, you, you want both sides of the of the door to be equal or to be able to have just one door open. Um, there's a, and there's a couple of other little things like that, but when I, I personally don't think uh, we should be going back to the original, especially because <clears throat> um, hearkening to what was just here is that's a good base. And also this is a retail use. And I think we have to think about that. So, <clears throat> You know, I, I thought the idea of putting more um, ironwork in the side windows might be pretty, but it wouldn't be useful for a retail space. Um, and the, you know, the proportions of the glass look fine. I do happen to agree with what Diana said um, on other side of the door. Um, that since there's a canopy, I'm imagining that when, when these uh, two sliver retail windows were designed, the reason why there's a transom above is because when they just had uh, one long pane of glass, it was maybe too tall and thin. But given that there's a canopy here might actually look better if if that trance if if there was no trance so I could accept it either way. Um, I think the signage is understated and uh, very appropriate uh, for what for what's here. I'm imagining if they want to put up a banner that they'll either go to staff or come back to us. I'm much you know you could. Um, speak to that. So I could approve this. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Jefferson? I think they're almost there. To me, the, the doors to left and right look a little stumpy. They look out of proportion. And I would imagine if they were taller and more classical, they'll be better. Um, the center door you know, either they have an automated door that opens two leaves, but this building is so insistently symmetrical, you know, that somehow it, it's always going to look odd if it stays this way. But, you know, it, it, I could approve it, you know, um, if, if, particularly if the two side ones didn't look so stumpy, if they went all the way up, taller, <laughs> more, more elegant in proportion, you know, it, it, Okay. That's my comment. Okay. All right. So I think we can make a motion here with some modifications to continue to work with staff. I think um, that we could do approval with modifications. And I do want to just say that, you know, th uh, that 
converting uh, and reusing former townhouses for retail space is something that happened historically in this district um, and, and in other uh, townhouses that are even individual landmarks in Midtown and has have happened even more recently. And we as a commission have approved removing stoops and lengthening the side windows at other townhouses to accommodate the new use. Even when there's been historic fabric, it's even easier when there isn't historic fabric. Um, so I think that you know, your, your general sense that this is appropriate is consistent with our, our own past regulatory history. But I think what we could do a motion to recommend approval with the con uh, condition that they continue to work with the staff to refine the proportions of the flanking doors uh, and considering eliminating the transom or thinking about those proportions in some other way and refining the proportions of the grills in the transoms um, above the door and the two flanking doors. So Commissioner Gustafson, would you make a motion uh, contingent upon them working with the staff to continue to refine the proportions? Uh, I'm going to try. Okay, thanks. And, and it can be simple, you know, because we can just say refine the proportions of the flanking doors and the grill work and along the lines of the discussion or the suggestions made during our discussion. Oh, we, oh, it'll be simple, all right. Okay. <laughs> in, in the matter of LPC 22-06084, 21 East 63rd Street in the Upper East Side Historic District. The application is to remove the stoop, alter the ground floor, and modify the areaway walls and ironwork. I note that the building style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Upper East Side Historic District. I recommend approval with modifications, noting that the first floor of the building stoop and areaway wall and fence were reconstructed in the Beaux-Arts style pursuant to a certificate of appropriateness issued in 1994. Therefore, the proposed work will not alter, eliminate, or conceal any significant historic features that the removal of the stoop to create at-grade entrance and at-grade entrance will maintain the proportions of at-grade entrances found on modified row houses throughout the historic district and will provide barrier-free access in the least obtrusive manner possible. That the unequal leaves at the main entrance door are needed to meet accessibility and egress requirements and will not call, up, cause un call undue attention to themselves. That the proposed ironwork at the windows and doors will match the design of the existing iron artwork to remain and will be in keeping with ironwork commonly found at window and door openings at lower floors at buildings of this style and age. That the modifications to the areaway wall and fence will be in keeping with the varying changes made to areaways at buildings throughout their historic district. That the proposed plaques will be typical in terms of materials and details and will be well scaled to the facade. That the proposed signage at the canopy will be small in scale, simply designed and will not draw, draw undue attention to itself. And that the work will not diminish the special architectural and historic character of the Upper East Side Historic District. Um, and I rec we recommend that the applicant work with staff to continue to, uh, to refine uh, the proportions of the flanking doors and to refine uh, the grill elements. Thank you. And Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Uh, yes, I would second it. And uh, sir, if I could just add a Okay, I, I sent you a comment. Okay, thanks. Okay, Bye -bye. thanks. All right. Okay, uh, John, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. All of in favor, and I oppose, the motion passes. So that's approved with those con the condition that you continue to refine the details and proportions with the staff. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll now move to public hearing item number eight. LPC 22-01004, an application for a certificate of appropriateness, number of Manhattan, block 717, lot 7502, 428 West 20th Street in the Chelsea Historic District. This is an Italianate style residence built in 1857, and the application is to construct a rooftop addition. Okay, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. You now have control of the presentation. You just need to click on your screen and then you can advance the slides using your arrow keys or your mouse. Please unmute yourself and state your name for the record and you may be. 
Hi, good afternoon. This is Jim Hill from Urban Pioneering Architecture. Uh, we are here to present a uh, proposed in vertical enlargement at 428 West 20th Street. I'll dive right in here and adjust my screen a little bit. There we go. Uh, so you can see here the existing front facade uh, location within the historic district. Uh, the front facade will remain completely untouched throughout the job. Uh, that the project here is uh, a kind of streetscape going from all the uh, the eastern end, 404, uh, down to uh, the western end of this kind of group of houses. Um, ours is 428 right here, and let's see. Uh, the existing roof on the left. Uh, we have a pitched roof, pitching forward and back with a ridge in the middle, uh, a bulkhead, and a couple of skylights. Um, and our proposal is a small, uh, basically master bedroom suite uh, with the roof terrace uh, pulled a couple of feet back from the back facade and from the front, I think about 18 feet, um, with a flat roof terrace here. Um, this will all be above the existing roof essentially. So the ceiling below, which is a cathedral ceiling will remain intact. The roof of our proposed addition is also a pitched roof in keeping with the uh, existing building there and that to the side. And we'll be cladding the roof in a standing seam metal. Uh, we have one thing we're gonna touch on a little bit more in a minute, it's the skylights here and here, one over the stairs and one over the bedroom. Um, I just want to point those out in a minute. Uh, the front chimney uh, will be basically capped. The boiler flue is the only thing active in there, will be extended uh, to join in with the rear chimney, which will be extended higher than the ridge line. Here we have the existing and proposed uh, elevations. Again, here is the skylight we'll be talking about in a minute over the bedroom. Um, rear elevations, again, no change to the existing building. All work is being done above the existing. Um, so the rear facade here, exterior is, will be stucco um, and typical double hung windows. So here on the left, we can see the existing conditions um, with this kind of multiple pitched um, cathedral ceiling, uh, pitched roof, the existing bulkhead coming up. Uh, the addition goes basically in place of the bulkhead. We'll be reworking this stair a little bit uh, so that it's interior to the apartment. Uh, it comes up in a hallway um, in the, uh, let's see. Oh, sorry, it's just going back the other way. Let's try this again, my apologies. So here uh, we have the block plan, views of the mock-up. Up here, the photo of the mock-up on the top right. Um, you can see we've, um, the entire mock-up here. This area where we've crossed out is where that skylight I was pointing out was we had a dormer in that bedroom, in the, kind of a shed roof dormer with a clear story window instead of the skylight. After we did the mock-up, we can see that that was the most visible part of the structure. So we're just kind of showing here where we're crossing it out um, to basically just show that we're not going to build it. But that was a concession that we made right off the bat to reduce the visibility uh, of the structure. Um, uh, this section here is the enlarged um, chimneys and the line going across the front is the front edge, it's called the front gutter of the roof and it pitches back uh, far enough so you're not seeing the top of the roof at all. You're basically just seeing a little bit of the front and a little bit of the side from this one vantage point um, here. Anywhere else on the block, you can see the buildings are taller and obscure that, uh, that view. From the rear, uh, there's a very large building getting even larger as we speak um, that does basically block any view of that structure. Other, other existing 
enlargements that have been approved and built very recently, 438, uh, 440 and 454 West 20th Street are all also slightly visible from the street. Um, and we feel that our proposed addition is certainly no more visible than any of these. Thank you very much. Uh, so going up from the, the view, just kind of an aerial view, is just kind of show the texture of the block that you can see a little bit more um, how prevalent there are many of these additions going on the roof of all of these buildings. Again, this is us 428 here. Um, these are the recently approved and built additions there. Um, and then kind of also we'd like to point out that on this Western side where we have these kind of additions on the Eastern side, we've got a lot of these dormers uh, and other kind of visible um, things that have been added onto the roofs over time. Well, I think that's basically it. And let me kind of go back. So there's one other point that I wanted to mention real briefly. Um, another concession that we made to try to decrease the visibility of it is slight off uh, asymmetry of this roof structure where this leading edge of the roof uh, has been brought down lower than the back, uh, again, just to reduce the visibility from the street. So, and that's it. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, do we have any questions? Okay, I don't see any questions at this time, so we'll move to public testimony. If you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Sasha Seely to take us through any testimony. Thank you. So I do have one sign up, Michelle Arbalu. Michelle, you will be receiving a request from me. Okay, Michelle, I see that you are in the meeting now. Please turn on your mic and state your name for the record. You have three minutes to speak. Hello, Michelle Arbelu for the Historic Districts Council. HDC finds this rooftop addition to be too visible and oversized for the building it sits upon. There is no reason that the vert vertical profile of this addition cannot be reduced in height and made less visible from the street. Additionally, we find the materials and detailing of this roof rooftop addition to be cheap looking and not well considered. We would ask the staff to work with the applicant to reduce the height of the, of the addition and develop a more sensitively detailed palette of materials and architectural details. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and I do see um, one more hand raised. Victoria's iPhone, you'll be receiving a request from me. Okay, Victoria, I see that you are in the meeting. Please turn on your mic and state your name for the record. You have three minutes to speak. Hi, my name is Victoria Hellstrom, 385 Greenwich, aka 71 North Moore. Uh, there seems to be some confusion. It's my understanding that Dove, uh, the developer, falsely claimed that these gorgeous uh, 1840 landmarks, row houses, that my understanding is they were rent regulated and that its residents okay. were Victoria? illegally... Yes. Victoria, let me interrupt you. We are reviewing an application for a rooftop addition at 428 West 20th Street. Is that the item that you oh, are testifying I, on? I apologize. No, I am online for the row houses in the meatpack. Okay, that's the next item. All right, let me take another glance over. And I do not see any more hands raised and anyone wishing to speak on this item. Okay, great. Thank you. And I'll note for the record that we did receive a resolution from Manhattan Community Board for recommending that the applicant reduce the addition by one foot to address the visibility from West 20th Street. Okay, Mr. Hill, would you like to respond to the comments we've heard? Uh, the, I guess the comment, the main comment was the height. Um, if We've actually kept the ceiling height in the spaces at, um, aside from the, the bedroom space where it's a cathedral ceiling, um, that front point is at eight feet, which we really did not feel as excessive. Um, the bathroom uh, and the uh, rooms in the back are have a finished ceiling height of nine feet. Uh, again, uh, I think is appropriate for the spaces in these buildings. Um, the only other way to reduce the height on this building, uh, on this addition, may have been to uh, lower the entire structure uh, by 
I guess possibly it would, it would result in flattening out the ceiling of the top floor apartment that this is duplex to. Um, and considering that the pitched roof uh, and cathedral ceiling are kind of one of the defining characteristics of that apartment, that seemed pretty inappropriate. So I don't really see any way that we could reduce the height further on this. Commissioners, any final questions? All right, I'm sending you requests so to unmute yourself. So please look for those. All right, and Commissioner uh, Lutfi, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Goldblum, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed and we're, we'll begin our discussion. Um, so, uh, this is an application for a rooftop addition, as we've seen, um, set back from the rear facade slightly, um, but pushed back, I think, as far as it could be, but it is uh, visible uh, over this, uh, from a side view over uh, the West 20th Street facade of the adjacent building. So, um, Let's have a discussion about that. The applicant addressed uh, their their uh, thoughts on lowering the height of the addition. Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you start this one? Sure. <clears throat> I mean, I um, I really do think that it should not be visible, but I don't exactly know what the solution could be. As the applicant says, dropping the ceiling heights. It, uh, enough to uh, allow for it to not be visible would really make for not terribly generous interior conditions. So um, I, I'm not comfortable with its visibility. And um, I, I'll just say that for now. Okay. And I'm thinking, you know, the community board suggested a foot, yeah. which I guess would bring it down to an interior ceiling height of eight feet, um, but might get it down between the hoods of the dormers, at least not projecting above the dormers. Right. Okay, Commissioner Holford-Smith. Um, yes, I'm looking at the section um, and it's showing a, an interior um, finished ceiling of nine foot six. And I believe that that's at the rear where the bathroom and the study occur. And I think that certainly could be an eight foot six ceiling. And if the bedroom started lower that it has a cathedral ceiling and it was skylights it's not going to feel claustrophobic so i don't see how why they can't drop it by a foot and i don't know if the 12 and uh, 5 on 12 slope is fire department related but they could lower the pitch of the roof as well to lower the chimney yeah great commissioner chapin yeah i i agree with those comments by commissioner uh Holford smith uh I also was troubled by the fact that the, you know, it's showing so uh, dramatically against the uh, dormers there. And I think they should uh, try to, uh, should do some actions to lower it. And I think the suggestions she made are uh, appropriate. So I, I can approve it, but I would like to see it lowered. And I think uh, that she gave some guidance as to how that could be achieved. Great, Commissioner Goldblum. I agree with what Ann said. I think that, that uh, with a little bit of work, it can be dropped. Although I must say that uh, the visibility is, is similar to other partially visible uh, approved projects. And I could approve it as is, but I think it would be uh, better if it were, if it were lower. Okay. Commissioner Devonshire. I can approve it if it is less visible. Commissioner Chen. Yeah, I think uh, the sentiment seems to be that we should lower it to the degree possible. Um, and, uh, and I agree with most of the comments. Commissioner Bland? I'm, I'm right there with everybody else. I think a foot or even more should be taken out of it. I mean, there's no reason that the top even has to be uh, a slanted ceiling. It could be flat. So uh, there's plenty of ways that, that it could be reduced. Commissioner Lutfi? I, I agree as well about reducing the height and minimizing the spillage. Commissioner Jefferson. I agree with Anne. Okay. And Commissioner Gustafson. I, I, as do I. Okay. 
All right, great. Commissioner Shamir Brown, are you comfortable making the motion to approve it with the condition that they work with the staff to reduce the height, the overall height and or slope um, to reduce its visibility? Sorry, yes, absolutely. Okay, great. Um, in the matter of LPC 2201004, 428 West 20th Street, Chelsea Historic District and Italian 8 style residence built in 1857 and the application is to construct a rooftop addition. I know that the building style, scale, materials and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Chelsea Historic District and I recommend approval with modifications that the construction of the rooftop addition and chimney extensions, finding that the, sorry, that the construction of the rooftop addition and chimney extensions will not damage or eliminate any significant architectural feature of the roof, that the size of the proposed addition will not overwhelm the building or the surrounding buildings, that the proposed rooftop addition will be set back from the front and rear facades, thereby helping to maintain a sense of the building's original massing, that the design and materiality of the rooftop addition featuring stucco cladding and standing seam metal roof and punched window and door openings will be in keeping with a variety of materials found at the the rooftop accretions and with the historic district and the proposed work will not detract from the special architectural and historic character of the Chelsea historic district. However, I find that the proposed rooftop addition and chimney extension will be moderately visible from the west above the adjacent primary facade of 430 West 20th Street and in conjunction with historic dormers at its roof and therefore I recommend that the height of the rooftop addition uh, be reduced to, min to minimal visibility, that is its overall um, height um, at, with the consideration potentially of the slope of the roof as well being modified to, um, to not be visible. Thank you. And uh, Commissioner Holford-Smith, would you second that motion? I second it. Thank you. John, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. And Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. The uh, 11 in favor, none opposed, the motion passes. So that's approved with the modification that you continue to work with the staff to reduce the visibility of the addition. Thank you. And we'll move to the next and last item. Okay, and that is public hearing item number nine, LPC 22-06133, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 738, lots one and eight. 44 to 54 Ninth Avenue and 351 to 355 West 14th Street in the Gansevoort Market Historic District. This is a row of Greek Revival style row houses with stores built circa 1845 to 46, and a row of Greek Revival style townhouses with stores built circa 1842 to 44. And the application is to reconstruct facades. Okay, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Uh, we are waiting for one member of the applicant team. Okay, um, they now have control of the presentation. Just click on your screen and then you can advance the slides using your arrow keys. Uh, please state your name for the record and you may begin. Mr. Barnett, we cannot hear you. Uh, the volume is very low. You want to adjust your mic? Is that? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear yes. you now. Okay. Uh, I would just ask uh, Way from VKSK to 
to put the presentation up. I just, I can't see it. I don't know if anyone else can. Well, we have, we can go to the first slide of the presentation. That would be, if you could, that'd be great. Your, um, your uh, Chung Wei Li needs to click on his screen, to click on their screen, and then they can advance the slides. Yes. There you go. All right, thank you. Thanks, Wayne. Okay. So let's, uh, let's try this again. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Dove Barnett. I am a partner at Tavros, one of the owners of and developers of this property. Um, in August of 2020, the commission approved our application for a development plan that included the restoration and renovation of the two buildings at the corner of 14th Street and 9th Avenue, as well as a new addition behind the historic buildings that was partially outside of the historic district. As you may recall, the commission's original approval included the complete reconstruction of the outer layer of the brick on the historic buildings due to the evident displacement of the face brick. Since that time, we have had to adjust the approved rest restoration plans to address the unsafe structural conditions discovered in the course of our work with respect to the backup brick. Our revised plans are predicated on a historically accurate reconstruction of the street facades of both buildings. The original brick has been carefully salvaged by hand and we will utilize as much of that brick as is structurally possible, interspersed with new matching brick as required. We are not making any other changes to what has already been approved in the C of A. For background, in August of 2020, we began non-structural interior demolition of the 14th Street building. Two layers of interior brick have been covered with sheetrock and plaster for decades. Prior to commencement of interior demolition, the restoration architect, in this case, Walter Melvin Associates, had done probes, but none of those probes had exposed the deterioration that became evident once the sheetrock, plaster, and floor and ceiling finishes were removed. We found that three layers of brick composing the street facade were separating from each other, and the facade was leaning toward the street and sidewalk. Bricks could be removed by hand without tools. Other bricks were missing from the backup and many of the full white wood grounds were badly deteriorated or missing. Numerous original wooden floor joists were not attached to the walls and others were sheared completely through. In short, the front facades of the buildings were not stable or securely attached to the side and lot line walls. This was an extremely dangerous condition for workers on site as well as the community at large. Given these very alarming conditions, our engineers immediately notified the Department of Buildings as is required by the construction codes. Following an inspection of both buildings, the Department of Buildings issued an emergency order calling for the full removal of street facing facade walls of both the 14th Street and 9th Avenue buildings to address this hazardous condition. Frankly, given the condition that we discovered, it is fortunate that there was not a catastrophic building failure while the buildings were occupied. During the course of dismantling the facades, while DOB has oversight of the permitting process and safety protocols, our team has worked closely with the commission staff with respect to how bracing and shoring would be implemented, as well as how we were documenting the original condition and performing the removal and storage of historic materials in anticipation of reconstruction. We know that there are members of the public who have alleged that these conditions were the result of our construction work on the site, or alternatively, had been created by inadequate maintenance in the few years that we have owned the buildings. However, both DOB and the commission concluded that the severe deterioration exposed during interior demolition was a result of decades of weathering, wear and tear, lack of maintenance, and trauma from previous alterations that far predated our stewardship of the site. Other members of the public have alleged that this situation is something we purposely created or are taking advantage of. Nothing could be further from the truth. We chose to develop this corner because we love these buildings. We have spent years with our architects and engineers designing a project that maintains and celebrates their history. Since our original proposal did not anticipate the facades would have been fully reconstructed, we did not budget for the time and cost that this will require. However, the delays and additional expense that reconstruction entails have not changed our vision for this project, and we remain committed to salvaging and using as much 
of the historic materials as possible to create an accurate reconstruction that is consistent with our original approval. Thank you. At this time, I'm gonna turn it over to George Schieferdecker from BKSK Architects to take you through the more technical aspects of the application. Well, Dove, we're gonna start with uh, Ted Eaker, who's gonna talk about uh, what he did uh, in his uh, probe work. Hi, uh, I'm Ted Ecker. I'm a principal at the firm of Walter B. Melvin Architects. Uh, we are the restoration architects for the historic structures. Uh, and we performed, performed sorry, over 30 interior probes across the two buildings. On the upper left are simplified floor plans of the second, third, and fourth floors of both buildings that indicate um, where the probes were performed. When I say that the pro plans are simplified, they're actually 12 apartments on each floor of the 14th Street building and 12 at the 9th Avenue building. So the buildings were altogether a conglomeration of many small rooms. Many of the units were occupied and or inaccessible at the time of the survey. And as David mentioned, all the exterior walls uh, of the 14th Street building were concealed by fully studded out sheetrock walls or plaster and lath, and all the ceilings were furred out. We knew that the face brick was not well tied into the backup masonry, having either blind headers or due to the age of the building, possibly no headers uh, whatsoever. Um, and the plan was always to carefully remove the face brick and salvage all sound brick for reinstallation. We were also aware that anchors tying back the facade to the party walls had been installed long before, but were exposed or revealed by probes, there was no definitive evidence that these were doing anything more than holding back the exterior wall to maintain the connection at the party wall and to tie back the face brick, which is not unusual in 19th century brick structures. The probes did expose what seemed like fairly typical backup conditions consistent with buildings of this age, where some areas of the mortar were in poor condition, localized brick replacement and reinforcement would be required. We also noted the need to completely reconstruct the single wife of backup brick below all the 14th Street windows, as well as the top several feet of the 9th Avenue wall immediately below the roof line. What these localized snapshots, if you will, could not have revealed was the full extent of the displacement of the backup walls, which was not understandable until the complete removal of all the furring, interior partitions, and ceilings was performed. Once fully exposed, we discovered that in some areas, entire wall sections were bowed out up to three inches from their original positions and that such displacement was not regular or aligned. In other words, the facade was essentially undulating both vertically and horizontally, um, as could be seen in one of the uh, prior photographs of the exterior where the uh, shoring channel was installed along the outside face of the 14th, <clears throat> 14th Street wall. Um, Next, and I'll throw it back over to George. Anyway, yeah, we can be on six, thanks. Um, our original proposal and the certificate of approval for this work. Uh, George, can I interrupt for a minute? Can you just state your full name for the record? Apologies, George Schieferdecker, BKSK Architects, um, and Harry Kendall, BKSK Architects, maybe adding some commentary as we move along. So our original proposal and certificate of approval for this work uh, included this complete removal of the face brick on both the Ninth Avenue facade and the 14th Street facade. Uh, our assumption as Ted has indicated was that the backup wall was sufficiently sound to allow measures to stabilize it followed by the reinstallation of all the face brick that was sufficiently whole and could be adequately cleaned along with new brick to match as closely as possible. Next slide. And as Dove has indicated uh, in his introduction, the only proposed amendment to the original C of A, other than minor details that I'll cover, the only proposed change is to be able to reconstruct instead of restore the backup brick wall along the 9th Avenue and 14th Street sides of the project, now that it has been removed following the DOP order. The image on the right is our previous proposal which inventories all of the elements of the facade that were to be rebuilt or reconstructed as part of the original proposal. And the image on the left shows the areas of the facade um, marked out in blue, whose backup wall is now also proposed to be reconstructed. We continue to propose facades that when complete 
will be identical from the viewpoint of the public appearance of the building to our original approved proposal and to the historic character of the buildings. The lower portion of the facade while at the storefronts will remain as per the original approved, including the preservation of the existing cast iron columns and the reconstruction of the wooden storefronts. Uh, the commission has approved facade reconstructions previously as noted in the insets at the top of the page. 35 Crosby was reconstructed with new brick after structural defects were discovered and 321, 323 Canal was partially demolished and new brick used in the reconstruction of its facade. Next. Immediately after the demolition order was issued, we went back and surveyed the front facades in greater detail than we had previously. Here's the work on the 14th Street facade. Next. Uh, we commissioned a second point cloud digital survey and Ted Eaker and his staff um, hand measured and surveyed all of the detailed conditions of the facade as well, so that their reconstruction could be completely accurate. Here's a survey of the dimensions of the 9th Avenue facade. Next. These two images show the difference between what had been approved on the right and what we are now proposing on the left. The brick wall will be rebuilt as a three wide brick wall, similar to the original. However, with new reinforcing and waterproofing, making it <clears throat> two and three eighths inch thicker. Please also note that on the interior, the brick was always to be covered with insulation and a finished material. Uh, this was required in order to be compliant um, with energy code. Next. Part of the original approved design was a new steel framing inside. That design has remained unchanged, except that the steel framing will need to be spaced further from the existing remnant party walls for clearances, since those party walls are more severely out of plumb than contemplated. Uh, the existing party walls will be salvaged and restored to a distance of five feet from the exterior walls as per the original proposal. Next. On the right is the previously approved brick. Um, we are currently estimating that 50 to 60% of the existing brick will be able to be reused either by putting it in place as it has been on the facade or by turning it, by turning painted or damaged brick around and, and using their rear faces. Uh, during the survey work and after stucco finishes and paint had been removed, we were able to determine that the existing brick was the same for both buildings and that it was a very uh, a smooth finished pressed brick. It is different from what we had originally proposed, which is shown in the image on the right. The team researched many sources, including from salvage brick companies to find a suitable match. And we think we have identified a brick that will be very close to the existing brick and finish and color. On the left is a mock-up that was recently reviewed with LPC staff that shows the results of our current research. And you can see uh, in the... Um, lower image, the brick called out that we feel is the most appropriate match uh, for what the existing brick set surround it. Preferred option was the Watsontown Columbia Smooth Brick. And we found that the back of the brick was actually more appropriate because its finish was not perfect and a bit rougher. Um, I wanted Ted to step in here and just say a few things about the brick, its documentation, its salvage, and the research of appropriate bricks to match. Um, which is all work that was completed by his firm. So, Ted, step in again. Okay. So, um, as to the process of, of brick removal and documentation and salvage, prior to uh, removal of any of the face brick, uh, as Georgia mentioned, once the pipe was up, um, each facade was carefully measured from the pipe scaffold to document the height and width of all the masonry openings and the pier and the spandrel dimensions between them. In addition, we took continuous dimensions of each brick uh, across each pier and end wall to be able to uh, fully document and accurately be able to recreate the exact brick coursing and position of each window opening. All bricks, including the backup brick, were removed by hand, no power tools were used, and all sound face brick was salvaged. Prior to removal, each facade was divided into vertical and horizontal panels. And as the brick was removed, it was organized and labeled by panel location. Base brick was carefully removed from the bridge in plastic buckets to the rear yard where mortar was removed using soft bristle brushes and putty knives before being stacked on pallets, encased in rigid insulation and shrink wrapped 
before being taken to a secure offsite location. Base brick from both buildings were sent to a testing laboratory to determine their load capacity and their weathering characteristics. Based on the test results, bricks from both were determined to pass all the requirements for severe weathering brick. Uh, so they are completely suitable for reuse. Base brick mortar samples were collected and sent to cultural heritage conservation for analysis, where it determined that a lime rich mortar was used, no surprise there, and will be replicated in the reconstruction. Samples of brownstone used as lintels and sills were also collected for color matching replacement units. Now in taking the detailed brick coursing dimensions, we found the brick varied from eight and a quarter inches in length to eight and three quarter inches, and from two and a quarter to two and three eighth inch in height. The most common length was eight and a half inches. Um, because of these dimensions, there were a limited number of stock brick available. As George said, we considered several, uh, including the Belden Croton and the Wassentown Columbia Smooth Brick. The Croton was thought to be too regular, too machined, uh, and the color was uh, just a bit off. Um, we found the Columbia to be a much better color and textural match to the original cleaned brick. Because both of these brick are eight and a half inches long, we've also considered the use of Bowerstone Aztec Red, which you can see on the top of the uh, two photographs to the left, um, which is a, an 11 and 5 eighth inch long brick, which can be cut down uh, where we need brick exceeding the eight and a half inches. Um, and uh, sorry, regarding the percentage of salvage brick we anticipate, uh, in addition to the, the damage caused by stucco installation and 180 years of exposure to weather, brick were also lost where uh, they were clipped for the blind diagonal headers at the 9th Avenue building. And at the 14th Street building, they actually uh, notched the back of the face brick out or cut it in half to receive projected stretcher backup brick. Um, so those are uh, obviously brick that uh, will not be able to, to be reused. Um, where possible, the new brick will be concealed behind building features such as shutters and leaders as well as located where not easily visible, such as immediately along the Ninth Avenue balconettes. Um, further distribution uh, is part of an ongoing discussion with uh, LPC staff. Next, George. Thanks, Ted. <clears throat> I think one of the issues that had come up <clears throat> in our original proposal was desire of the commission to emphasize the difference between the Ninth Avenue building and the 14th Street building and the way the facade brick was treated. Uh, we had proposed to show in the image on the right that the brick of the 14th Street building, which had been painted white, would remain with a significant remnant of the paint on it. Uh, in conducting paint removal samples prior to demolition, we determined with LPC staff that the best treatment for the brick would be a more complete removal of the white paint. So as part of this proposal, we are clarifying that the difference between the buildings will still be evident, um, but less noticeable. Next. So one of the more Intriguing discoveries upon removing the stucco facing in the Ninth Avenue brick uh, building <clears throat> was the fact that painted signage had covered the upper brick facade of the corner section. Um, we have saved this brick, but in discussions with LPC staff, noting the preferences of ownership and keeping in mind the restrictions of current zoning for exterior signage, we we're proposing to use the rear faces of that brick where salvageable and not make any effort to recreating the signage or hinting at it as its existence. Uh, this approach will stay true to the intent of the approval, which was to hew closely to the oldest row house appearances of these buildings on their upper floors, previous to commercial tenancies. Uh, details that we are restoring, such as the shutters, were likely removed in the early 1900s, which made the extent of this signage possible. We are proposing to stay consistent with the emphasis on an earlier time period for the buildings by not keeping the signage. We note it now so that a future commercial tenant seeking approval of visible signage at the corner could refer back to this history. Next. In our previous proposal, we had speculated that on the Ninth Avenue building, the second floor windows had once extended down to the floor in concert with a balconette and proposed a reconstruction of both elements. During recent removals, we were able to discover that that conjecture was accurate as you can see in the image at the top left, where underneath the brick, 
underneath the window, the brick is clearly very different and added at a later date. Therefore, the lowering of the windows in the balconette remained part of our reconstruction. Next. George, let me, George, let me just jump in for a second. Sure. Um, sure. Um, I, I'm sure that when you saw the, our drawings of the original signage, it seems very intriguing and certainly intriguing to us. We love that signage. Um, when we contemplated w in what way it would influence us, um, we were we also real, began to realize that the the shutters that were, as George said, um, bringing back an album that was existed on the, when when they were townhouses as bifold shutters, and and pre, they, those shutters predated the signage. We found that it was going to be it it, it was a messy hybrid of restoration if we tried in a way to restore some of the signs. So ultimately we came to an unconflicted decision that stay the course with the, with the aesthetic vision of bringing the, the facades of the original townhouses back as, as the, the street face and a representative of the earliest parts of the Gansford district. Thanks. Um, so way, yeah, thank you. Um, so in, <clears throat> The realm of small discoveries, uh, when the aluminum sheathing was removed from the window surrounds, um, remnants of the original brick mold were discovered and it was more simple than what was originally proposed, which is shown on the right. So we are revising that detail to be closer to the historic profiles as shown on the left. Next, Harry uh, mentioned the shutters and as part of our original C of A, we had proposed reestablishing the historic shutters as requested by the commission. Uh, we are taking this opportunity to make it clear that we had proposed bifold shutters so that their dimension would fit within the available dimension between windows without overlap. That was a bit confusing in some of the documentation we had provided. Next. So finally, um, we wanted to give a quick status report um, on the other elements of the project, some less visible and in the rear and their reconstruction slash restoration. All of these elements will be treated as per the original C of A. This includes the substantially visible west wall of the 14th Street building, the party walls as have been mentioned to extend five feet into the buildings and the rear walls of both buildings. All of these elements are currently braced and shored in place. The rear walls have a thick stucco coating adhered directly to them. You can see it in that picture on the top left uh, or to a cementitious undercoat. Removal of the stucco or the undercoat will likely destroy the face finish of that brick. This was noted in our original proposal. We are stabilizing the backup brick, adding brick where the backup brick is only a single white, and then removing the face brick, turning it around where it is salvageable and adding new brick to match where it is not. Uh, the resultant volume of the buildings and the historic openings will be preserved as per the original proposal shown on the right. Next. So. Uh, in conclusion, I mean, what we are requesting approval for is the reconstruction of the front facades of the 9th Avenue and 14th Street buildings in conformance with the original C of A, with the difference being that the backup brick wall will be reconstructed as opposed to restored. The final appearance of the proposed reconstruction, including the face brick, will be entirely in conformance with the original C of A. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. Commissioners, do we have any questions? Yes, Commissioner Devonshire, please go ahead. Sure. Yes. Did you have a question, Commissioner Devonshire? Um, yeah. It was mentioned. That, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, I was, I think there was a lag. Okay. It was mentioned that notched bricks. Um, were to be discarded and, and couldn't be reused. Um, I'd like to know what percentage of the total brick uh, um, are notched and or what number there are, because it is it has been standard procedure for our office when we have a situation where we have, have stretcher bond and it's going to, to be changed to a mechanical uh, fastening system that we reuse the notched brick the notch uh, face brick, uh, because all it all it means is there's a corner of the brick that's been knocked off, and it doesn't affect the appearance of it at all or the performance. 
I, I don't have an exact number, but if you're talking about diagonal clipped brick, those were saved. Um, on 14th Street, they they were, uh, it was different. They, they did not use diagonal clipped uh, headers. They um, actually cut the stretcher face brick, uh, basically ripped it in half um, to accommodate, mm -hmm. <clears throat> excuse me, the projected stretcher brick. Um, okay, so, so you, you but, had mentioned but, that notch brick are going to not be reused, so that that's good to hear. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Why don't we move to public testimony? We may have more questions after that. If you're in the meeting and would like to testify on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. As always, we will start with anyone who signed up in advance and get to others. And whether or not you signed up or not, whether or not you signed up in advance, please raise your virtual hand so that as we work through the sign-in sheets, we can still identify you in the meeting. And I will turn it over to Sasha Seeley to take us through the testimony. All right, thank you, Chair Carroll. So first I'm starting off with Manhattan Community Board 4, Paul Devlin. Paul, you should be receiving a request from me. Okay, Paul, I see that you are in the meeting. Please turn on your mic and you can turn on your camera if you wish. But state your name for the record. You have three minutes to speak. Um, good afternoon, Chair Carroll and commissioners. My name is Paul Devlin. I'm co-chair along with Betty McIntosh of the Manhattan Community Board for Chelsea Land Use Committee. Recently, CB4 voted unanimously to recommend to the Landmarks Preservation Commission to approve with conditions this application to amend the certificate of appropriateness for the reconstruction of the facades on the road houses at 9th Avenue and West 14th Street, a key intersection in the Gansport Market Historic District. The two conditions are that, one, new replacement bricks on facades be installed in locations with low visibility, and two, we request a public space on the site be, re be created to commemorate the history of the row houses, including their reconstruction, past uses, and architectural changes, photos of the original buildings, and the newly discovered historic signage. During the public review of the original 2020 application, the community expressed a great deal of alarm and anxiety about this project. A major objection was that the infill office building behind the historic row houses was inappropriate. In 2020, LPC issued an approval of the project which stated that the facades of the row houses would be restored. CB4 welcomed the restoration of the front facades to give a sense of their 1840s Greek revival style. However, interior demolition work resulted in the discovery that the back of walls of the row houses facades were extremely deteriorated. The Department of Buildings declared that the fa facades created an unsafe condition and must be entirely demolished. Beyond what the applicant just listed about community concerns as to how this happened, some in the community also thought that this situation could have been prevented if more preservation measures were put in place before the demolition started. The current proposed amendment would allow for the reconstruction of the facades instead of their preservation or restoration. While approximately 50% of the existing facade bricks are to be used for reconstruction, many preservationists contend that reconstruction is misleading and inauthentic. Deep disappointment in this situation has led to some to call for the rescinding of the entire project and replacing it with a modern design or a park. However, CB4 recommends that LBC approve of the proposed amendment with the two previously mentioned conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Andrea Goldwyn from New York Landmark Conservancy, you'll be receiving a request from me right now to rejoin the meeting as a panelist. Okay, Andrea, I see that you are in the meeting. Please turn on your mic and state your name for the record. You have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Good day, Chair Carroll and Commissioners. I'm Andrea Goldwyn speaking on behalf of the New York Landmarks Conservancy. We support this proposal to reconstruct the facades of these 1840s Greek Revival townhouses and row houses. In June 2020, we supported the application for restoration of the buildings in conjunction with a new tower behind them. We raised concerns about the proposed storefronts and we're glad to see the commissioners instruct the project team to modify the design so that it better reflected the configuration of the historic storefronts. Now we support the plan under consideration today to reconstruct the facades following that same design. The team has proposed to reuse 50 to 60% of the historic brick. We encourage them to use at least 60% and more if it becomes available. 
the discovery of the ghosts of painted signs reveals another compelling layer of the building's history. And we suggest that the fragments are documented and the graphics incorporated into the reconstructed row houses or new tower, perhaps not under the purview of LPC, but a nice nod to the building's history. We appreciate the ongoing communication from the project team since the structural damage emerged. From that moment, they indicated they would reconstruct the buildings and this proposal proves out that intention. Given the situation, we request that going forward, LPC require interior probes prior to permits being issued for applications for substantial gut renovations, such as this one, of buildings of this age. Thank you for the opportunity to express the Conservancy's views. Thank you. All right, Andrew Berman from Village Preservation, you will be receiving a request from me now to rejoin the meeting as a panelist. Okay, Andrew, I see that you are in the meeting. Please turn on your mic, state your name for the record. You have three minutes to speak. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Uh, Good afternoon, commissioners, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm Andrew Berman, Executive Director of Village Preservation, speaking on behalf of the organization. We and many others were deeply troubled by the partial demolition of these nine landmarked, nearly 200-year-old houses that define the Gansevoort Market Historic District. Something is deeply wrong when plans approved by both the LPC and DOB either don't find or lead to conditions that supposedly create an imminent danger requiring the dismantling of landmarked buildings. Regardless of who was at fault here, and clearly one or more entities was, this project is no longer the one approved by the commission in 2020, as these houses have now been severely compromised. All prior approvals should therefore be rescinded and reconsidered. Frankly, it is entirely inappropriate to consider the reconstruction of these buildings as a simple amendment to the original application. In light of the much greater degree of loss of historic fabric here, we believe strongly that the approvals for the large office structure behind these buildings should be rescinded. Those approvals were granted as part of a larger package that included a much greater degree of preservation and reuse of the existing historic buildings. With those elements gone, the prior approvals should no longer be valid. And if the conditions at the buildings which led to the imminent danger declaration were in fact pre-existing as the applicant claims, then the applicant failed in their due diligence to care for and maintain these landmarked historic buildings. Had, had these supposed pre-existing conditions been identified earlier, less dramatic and invasive measures might have been possible to make repairs before construction began, leading to a better outcome and a more complete and accurate analysis of the alteration and construction plans, their impacts, and their appropriateness. Such failures on the part of the applicant should not be rewarded with their automatically being entitled to move ahead with all other elements of this construction project as planned, when they have not lived up to their obligations to maintain the building or construct the restoration work approved in the prior C of A. Anna Markham, also from Village Preservation, will provide additional testimony about the specifics of the proposal before you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, Anna Markham from Village Preservation, you will be receiving a request from me now to rejoin as a panelist. Okay, Anna, I see that you are in the meeting. Please turn on your mic and state your name for the record. You have three minutes to speak. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, commissioners, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Anna Markham, and I'm the Director of Research and Preservation for Village Preservation, speaking on behalf of the organization. One of the few positive aspects of this fiasco has been the discovery of an exceptionally well-preserved painted wall sign on the Ninth Avenue facade. We believe that every effort possible should be made to reconstruct this sign. While we understand that many of these bricks have been cut in specific ways to adhere them to the facade originally, we do not believe that that would render these bricks useless as a veneer, at the very least, so long as their top painted surface is intact. Any bricks that are part of the historic painted sign and deemed unsalvageable should be thoroughly documented and inspected by LPC before being permanently discarded. Overall, much greater effort should be made to preserve and reuse the existing historic brick in the reconstruction. Since this is now an entirely new construction, split or otherwise damaged bricks would still be salvageable as a historic veneer, which would be preferable to any newly pressed brick. Salvaged brick 
sourced from similar structures should be considered as the first alternative in replacing lost brick in this project with the use of newly pressed brick as a last resort. Great damage has been done here, not just to these buildings in this district, but to the integrity and process of the land of landmark preservation in New York City. We urge you not to compound that damage by considering this a small amendment to an existing approval and to allow a lesser degree of restoration using historic materials to take place here than is possible. Please revoke the original approvals, reconsider the office tower plan and require a much greater degree of reuse and replacement of historic materials on these iconic landmark buildings. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I will be calling on Pamela Wolf. Pamela, you will be receiving a request from me. Okay, Pamela Wolf from Save Chelsea. I see that you are in the meeting now. You can go ahead, please turn on your mic and state your name for the record. You have three minutes to testify. <laughs> Good afternoon, I am Pamela Wolf. I'm the president of Save Chelsea. Save Chelsea thanks the commissioners for sharing our deep concern about facadism in deliberating this project and ensuring that more of the original row houses, historic fabric behind their street facades will be preserved. As noted by preservationist Andrew Dolkart, facadism, quote, has become the biggest issue in Greenwich Village and Chelsea where early houses are being completely destroyed with interiors gutted, roof lines expanded and rear yards removed, end quote. Uh, facadism has destroyed much of the integrity and authenticity of Chelsea's historic district. It urgently called for awareness and attention from the commission. Community Board 4's May 14th, 2020 letter on this project's initial proposal advised limiting its tower to six stories contextual with the one to six story streetscape of the Gansevoort Market Historic District as described in its designation report. <clears throat> the tower is by no means the quote, infill addition, end quote, blithely described by the applicant. It will fill no gap in the street wall. At the project's first public hearing in June of 2025, of 10 commissioners objected to building any tower in the row house backyard. Commissioner Goldblum said the idea was, quote, typo typologically very inconsistent with the way New York developed, end quote, and inherently pro problematic. <clears throat> when a scaled back version of the tower was presented in a public meeting two months later, almost all of the commissioners who voted to approve it stated that it would be better one story shorter or if its Ninth Avenue top floor setback was carried around to 14th Street. In the end, the commissioners approved the eight story tower as it was presented, a structure two stories taller than any that it has ever approved within the district and only one story less than the original proposal. While there was no explicit quid pro quo linking the tower's approval to the row houses restoration, they are a part and parcel of the same proposal and any adaptive reuse justification for the tower would have been grounded in preserving the row houses through their associated, associated revitalization. Now they will not be restored, but replicated in much less valuable results. Even if the applicant is not responsible for this debacle, the project's calculus has changed. The same tower might never have overcome the commissioner's resistance and reservations if mere replication of the row houses had been expected. Enough has changed about this project that the tower should be reopened to discussion. We urge the commissioners to have the courage of their convictions and insist on the further reduced tower they said would be more appropriate. We also support Community Board 4's call for a substantial public amenity on site, describing the history of these nine, nine lost treasurers, not two buildings, nine. Thank you. Thank you. George Calderaro from Victorian Society, New York. You'll be receiving a request from me right now. Okay, George, I see that you are in the meeting. Please turn on your mic and state your name for the record. You have three minutes to testify. Good afternoon, commissioners. 
George Calderaro, board member of the Victorian Society in New York and co-founder of Save Gansvort Market, the group that successfully sought landmark designation for the Gansvort Market Historic District nearly 20 years ago. We won't comment on the previously approved design for the reconstruction and new building, as these don't seem to be on the table, except to take issue with the lack of restoration of the historic dormers and strange shutters that don't appear to fit the window openings. We're also not commenting on the decision to demolish the facades, as this is a fait accompli, except to note that the documentation provided is insufficient to tell us wh whether the deteriorated conditions illustrated were typical or reflected limited outlier conditions that could have been addressed in a less invasive way. Instead, we'll take this opportunity to look at this fiasco in terms of lessons learned and ways to help avoid such situations in the future for all of us. The real estate industry has never seen a low rise landmark on which it wouldn't like to build an addition. With all due respect, the commission is far too accommodating to this point of view. Small additions that fit into within a jumble of roofscapes are one thing, but large and highly visible additions and towers are something else and should not be regularly approved. A favorite tactic of developers is to submit the most outrageous proposals with the expectation that everyone will be happy when they are cut back to a more reasonable size or appropriate design. This should have been seen for what it is, an attempt to move the end result in their favor by shifting the starting point. The commission should forcefully resist such tactics. The commission should rededicate itself to the preservation of historic fabric and in-kind replacement. This will require revisiting some of the rules that mandate staff approval of work that doesn't meet historic preservation standards, such as wholesale removal of historic windows. It would also help to nurture the craftsmanship and traditional restoration trades we need to support the long-term future of historic preservation in New York. The commission should consider revising the definition of, quote, protected feature and exterior architectural feature, feature in the administrative code. The current definitions are increasingly resulting in the loss of historic buildings to facadism as here. When conflicts arise between good preservation practice and other mandates such as accessibility and sustainability, preservation goals should not always defer to others. Often these other codes allow exemptions for historic buildings. We should use them. When codes and regulations are being drafted or rewritten, the commission should be at the table to protect the interests of historic preservation. The commission's allies in the preservation community would support these efforts. Finally, the manner of resolution of issues of structural stability have been devastated, have devastating impacts on historic buildings as we see here today and elsewhere in the past. The commission must devise a process whereby it can quickly engage engineers who have experience with and appreciation for historic buildings to provide independent transparent assessments of conditions and to suggest preservation oriented approaches before demolition orders are issued. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle Arbelou from Historic District Council. You should be receiving a request from me right now. Okay, Michelle, I see that you're able to join the meeting. Please turn on your mic and state your name for the record. You have three minutes to testify. Hello, Michelle Arbelou for the Historic Districts Council. HTC believes that stabilization, preservation, and restoration of the existing facade is possible and should therefore be pursued. This level of masonry degradation is prevalent throughout New York's historic districts and its historic buildings, and many architects and structural engineers are regularly able to develop and successfully ex execute projects that maintain these masonry walls. We see no compelling evidence in this presentation that the walls cannot be properly salvaged. The wood nailers in the inner wife of brick could be carefully removed and replaced with new brick to stiffen up the inner wife. The remainder of the inner wife can then be repointed and stabilized. The outer restoration work can then be executed. It appears to us that the shoring system that is already in place in the first and proper step to successfully stabilizing and restoring these walls. We encourage all parties involved to put their heads and expertise together and save this facade. Thank you. Thank you. All right, save Gansevoort. Um, Zach Weinstein, you'll be receiving a request for me. Um, 
Okay, I see that you are in the meeting. Please unmute your mic and state your name for the record. You have three minutes to testify. Hello, uh, my name is Zach Weinstein. Uh, is my microphone working? Yes, we can hear thank, you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, sorry, my name is Zach Weinstein, co-organizer co of Save Gansvort. We, we, as a community, now find ourselves facing an, an unacceptable situation resulting from the substantial demolition of these nine iconic and irreplaceable townhouses. Iconic and irreplaceable, incidentally, being the descriptions that the developer provide, provided in their own uh, source materials, touting uh, touting their project to the uh, to the community. Um, these buildings should have been properly inspected prior to, prior to making the LPC application and prior to the beginnings of interior demolition. If the damage is so extensive as the developer now claims, it, it, it just defies imagination that no one was aware of the extent of the weaknesses in the structure in advance of that application. And if, that, if, if those conditions were known, then the Per, then, then the application for such substantial structural work should never have been made in the first place and should certainly never have been approved by LPC and by DOB. What troubles me about what I've heard so far from the commission uh, in, in this hearing is a lack of recognition of just what a failure the current situation represents. This is really not a time for, this should not, must not be a time for business as usual. The commission needs to take, make a firm statement that this kind of failure is not acceptable, must not happen again. And I believe that the way to do that is as uh, Village Preservation has, suggest, has suggested, to rescind the earlier permissions, the earlier uh, approvals of this project, and particularly the approval of the tower. This application, given what has happened, should be considered de novo, it should start over again. Um, and a serious signal needs to be sent to everybody that there are consequences for these kinds of mistakes and procedures must be put in place to make sure that they simply do not happen again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Peter Stevens, you should be receiving a request from me right now. Okay, Peter Stevens, I see that you have accepted my request. Please turn on your mic and state your name for the record. You have three minutes to testify. Hello, um, I'm Peter Stevens. Can you see and hear me? We can hear you, but we can't see you. I see, okay. Okay, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, uh, I'm in, in support of several of the other speakers, so I'll get right to it. This is a unique corner. This corner was highlighted in the very detailed original designation report for the Gansfort Market Historic District, in which the most salient details read, quote, visual cohesion is provided to the streetscapes by, and then again, quote, the one to six story scale, quote, the stretch of 9th Avenue between Gansevoort and West 15th Streets, albeit altered and interrupted with later in additions, offers the vista of a distinctive Manhattan streetscape featuring 20 buildings of the 1840s and culminating in the rare picturesque ensemble of 12 row houses and townhouses. Numbers 44 to 69th Avenue and 351 to 355 West 14th Street. Without rehashing the back and forth that led to the approval of this ill-conceived project, it must be acknowledged that that approval was based on a completely different set of facts and assumptions than those that you are considering today. It is not relevant to try to cast blame for this. It is simply a fact, and it is evident that any trade-off or compromises that were made in the previous process must now be seen afresh. The attempt to use two-dimensional renderings and to hold buildings outside the district as models for what, what could be built on this landmark site and the inappropriate, quote, filling in of the donut that the commissioners spoke out so eloquently against. Now, in the absence of the careful and detailed preservation of the row houses, 
is even more inappropriate than it was before. The entire project must be rethought. In the very least, we must preserve the historic one to six story scale and the typology of these 19th century residential structures with open space behind that defined this picturesque gateway into the district. The boundary of this historic district was carefully determined when these buildings and the space behind them was defined, which defines them, were thoughtfully included and set aside for preservation in the first place. I speak on behalf of many, many residents of the neighborhood and respectfully implore the commission not to allow the complete destruction of this historic treasure solely to benefit a commercial interest. There is no other benefit that can be claimed for it whatsoever. It would be a disastrous precedent. Thank you very much for your work and thank you for hearing me. All right, for my next sign up, Cristobal Goff, you'll be receiving a request from me now. Okay, okay, perfect. I see that you've accepted my request. Please unmute your mic and state your name for the record. You have three minutes to testify. Thank you. Uh, this is Cristobal Goff, uh, speaking for the Society for the Architecture of the City. The designation report explains the evolution of this district and speaks of retaining a sense of place as a market district. Numerous photographs, many of them historic, document the character that was responsible for the district's original appeal. Age, history, and the mere effect of time were part of its charm. It is relevant to recall this because the character of the district greatly complicates any appro appropriate construction. It should have been a factor in the original parti, but instead radical alterations, which proved to be unsafe, were coupled with an ill-conceived generic facade renovation that made the buildings almost unrecognizable. This defective concept should never have been presented or approved but the disaster that followed makes it difficult to retain any confidence in the integrity of the review process or in the competence of those originally responsible for designing the interventions, not to mention those who subsequently approved the plans and failed to supervise the work. These buildings were not destroyed as the result of a hardship finding, ostensibly, they were being protected and preserved as a part of the heritage of the city of New York. The capacity to do, what, do that seems to be slipping out of reach. And that is the best case scenario because it assumes that the governmental agency and the applicant actually intended to enforce the law and preserve the property. We agree with village preservation that this application is not business as usual. This issue cannot be resolved by tinkering with the design of a new facade. Village preservation website suggests that the entire original approval should no longer be regarded as valid. Is there to be no penalty for the destruction of a landmark? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Todd Fine, you will be receiving a request for me to join the meeting as a panelist. Okay, Todd, please turn on your mic and state your name for the record. You have three minutes to speak. Okay, Todd, I see that you are in the meeting. You just have to turn on your mic. Yes, hello. Um, I am Todd Fine. I'm the president of the Washington Street Advocacy Group, which for 10 years has advocated for preservation of Little Syria and the downtown community house, uh, settlement house. Now, it is rare that we have a case that so elegantly summarizes both the current status of the historic preservation regime of universally conceded neglect 
in disregard uh, of maintenance to the point of apparently uh, imminent uh, collapse, and play acting by developers under a hazy and non-transparent regulation by DOB, if not here, but certainly elsewhere, and then predicts the future under an agenda of mega upzoning, a series of non-transparent staff-level negotiations regarding the extent of demolitions in order to enable historic buildings to become generic ahistorical facades for towers. It's hilarious that the developers and the architects would characterize the new construction, entirely new construction of a historic building as a minor amendment to a, a past approval given these extraordinary circumstances. The implications of the uh, decision today um, set the tone for the, not only for the coming decades of upzoning historic preservations uh, of, of historic districts, uh, the, these upzonings that are planned both under the SOHO rezoning and the future upzonings that are planned when the impetus for such projects will become inevitable uh, and overwhelming. LPC was completely absent from the entire discussion of the SOHO NOHO rezoning for the last two years until just a few days ago when LPC announced that they would facilitate at a staff level uh, how to develop under this cir circumstances. Today, we see the type of issues that urgently needed discussion over those last two years. So are we going to go through Soho and discover, what do you know? A lot of these historic buildings in Soho just happen to be uh, at risk of imminent collapse. It seems like this could happen in dozen situations. Maybe we'll have this every couple quarters from now on. Certainly, there's going to be an impetus for tower constructions. And if the engineering reports aren't made public, are we going to have to trust the developers, as we're asked today, since there was no disclosure of this? And why? Why should we trust them? Buildings far worse if many people who've been in the preservation industry or the, this community for years have many other buildings have far worse shape have been supported. Why not pursue a higher standard? Would other countries do this? Is this the international standard? Hardly. And why is there no independent assess assessment here? Why has nothing been made public? Shouldn't we have someone outside look at the destruction of nine historic buildings? Seems it seems like a very high level thing that deserves some investment and investigation. This demolition occurred at a staff level, a pattern, pattern that we're seeing in other uh, demolitions of very important buildings like the McGraw Hill, uh, the McGraw Hill Interiors, Grant Prospect Hall, and the City Corp Fountain. Um, so here we here we, so this is a foreshadowing of the years to come when the pursuit of towers in historic districts we may see other demolitions. So today's a day to step back from business as usual. Hold off to just the, the blanket approval of a tower going through a plan that's the circumstances have changed and ask real questions. What, what do we need to do? Do we need to survey historic buildings that are so damaged that they imminent, require imminent, uh, imminent demolition? Shouldn't the overall problems with the historic preservation regime be the topic of discussion today? When will the commission and the, the members of the commission Excuse take me, initiative Tom? away from staff? Hi, that's, I'm going to have to ask you. Yes, I'm going to have to ask you if you can please wrap up. We've gone yes. over our three minutes. So that's my 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 appeal today is for the commissioners to to take control of their their function as a historic preservation commission and set up a new regime to deal with this problems. These are not staff. This is not an amendment issue. This is not a staff level issue. This this is the future of the historic preservation regime. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Victoria's iPhone. You will be receiving a request from me to rejoin the meeting. Okay, Victoria, I see you have accepted my request. Please unmute your mic, state your name for the record. You have three minutes to testify. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, thank you very much for having me. I tried uh, to use my video, but for some reason you can't see me. Uh, thank you very much, commissioners, for having me here today. I. Uh, Please just state your name for the record, Victoria. I'm sorry, my name is Victoria. Hillstrom, and I am here to support, uh, as the Greenwich Village Historic Society has said very clearly, this is not the project that was approved. I find the notion that these buildings were in imminent danger to be uh, not valid. I have photos of the workmen working inside the buildings, setting up shop, that their own employees did not believe that these buildings were in danger, that I am very happy to provide the commission. I happen to know this developer personally who is involved in a scam at 200 West 15th Street uh, where he had his mother pose as an illusory tenant for a playroom for his children in a rent stabilized uh, building. His mother lives in North Carolina where Dove had rented the penthouse. He subsequently left 
and then put in a sublet who he evicted by never serving her notice. And the poor thing came home one day and uh, the marshal had changed the locks and and uh, he, he just trickery. So for many reasons, I uh, don't believe that these landmarks were ever in danger. I work just around the corner. They are our beautiful crown jewels uh, of this neighborhood. And I would really uh, implore the commissioners uh, to really rescind this reproval. Uh, there is no evidence these buildings were ever in imminent danger. They have failed to present evidence that in fact that there were. And you know, as Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis so eloquently said, if we don't preserve our history, if we don't preserve our landmarks, what will be left to inspire our children? And I really, uh, really uh, would ask that our commissioners look long and hard at what is happening with our landmarks, with Soho at risk, with 250 water that could demolish the entire seaport. This is very, very serious. And let's not forget that if the developer had in fact gone down 10 grade, it was his responsibility to uh, survey the surrounding landmarks. So that I would, uh, again, please ask, really beg of our commissioners to please rescind the approvals. And uh, really, if there's no tower over what the developer has done, that would be fine with me. And I think I speak for many New Yorkers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victoria. All Thank right. You. I'm see. sorry that I couldn't join you on video. No worries. All right. Let me just take a glance back over. And I do see that we do not have any more hands raised, so there is no one else who wishes to testify. I would just like to add for the record that we received a letter, in a joint letter from Assembly Member Deborah Glick and Senator Brad Holman um, requesting that LPC require the developer to restore the work rather than seek approval for new materials. All right, thank you very much. And thank you for every, everyone for participating. I know this is, a, you know, this is a very important subject. And I think that we, these are extremely prominent buildings. I think we all share um, our uh, very disappointed feelings that we're in this place today. Um, there are a lot of accusations and allegations. And I think that we need to kind of separate that. What, has transpired was not an approval by the staff. That should be clear. This was um, some interior work had started and it was not uh, as a result of the construction of a previously approved addition. It was the some interior work had started that revealed um, these hazardous conditions and DOB was notified immediately as required by law and DOB uh, issued orders for the dismantling. And we have been working very closely with DOB on uh, ex the exec and the applicants on the execution of that. And so we're at a place today where, you know, the um, cast iron elements at the ground floor are still there. Some of the party walls and some of the foundations are still there. And the proposal is to reconstruct, reusing as much fabric as possible. Um, not a situation that um, we love, but it, it has, you know, there are times when we are faced with historic buildings that are in a hazardous condition and we have had to uh, face reconstruction. So we'll be thinking about that today. I think before the applicants respond, I just wanted to ask John Weiss, our deputy counsel, who's been very involved in all of our discussions with DOB and trying to understand the, the uh, structural issues here, if there's anything you'd like to add. Just very briefly, Sarah, I just want to emphasize something that you said and the owner, Mr. Barnett said, um, that the it wasn't the owner's engineer who said the facades need to come down. It was the owner's engineer, as you pointed out, who is required by law to alert the department of buildings when they discover what they believe is an unsafe condition. And at that point, the engineers from the department of buildings inspect, as they did in this case, and the DOB engineers determined the facades were a threat to public safety and had to come down. Uh, and while that's obviously a very disturbing conclusion and is something that ends up being very high profile, uh, I should just note that uh, in many cases, 
when we do joint inspections uh, with the landmark staff and department building engineers to landmark buildings that are compromised, in most of those cases, the DOB engineers do not order the facade taken down or the buildings demolished. In the majority of those cases, they order shoring, bracing, or other repairs be done to save the buildings. Uh, but they look at each case, obviously, individually. In this case, the DOB engineers did determine it was an imminent threat to public safety. Uh, when they make that determination and DOB, the DOB commissioner issues an order to take down the facades, uh, the LPC is actually preempted under the landmarks law under uh, section 25312 from our normal review process. Uh, that being said, we are involved uh, in, in the process in that we were in close contact with the applicants and the DOB engineers uh, to try to minimize the damage, uh, understanding that we couldn't stop the, the uh, deconstruction of the facades, but we were involved with having the uh, bricks and the cast iron salvaged and the detailed drawings of the facades made so they could be reconstructed. That's all. Okay. Thank you. All right, I'd like to turn back to the applicants and ask if you'd like to respond to the comments we've heard. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Valerie Campbell. I'm a counsel to the owner. And I would like to thank both the chair and John Weiss for clarification of the DOB order. Um, once the DOB order was issued, um, as, the, as the chair noted, um, the, our, the ownership was required to implement that order. And, but we did so in full consultation with the staff as to the requirements in terms of documenting the facade, salvaging the brick. And um, so it was done with the utmost care, but we didn't have any choice but to comply with the DOB emergency order. So I thought that that was important to, to sort of re-emphasize because some of the testimonies sort of seemed to indicate that this was done, you know, with staff approval or on the owner's initiative. And in fact, it was purely in response to the DOB order. So. Okay, and so the, you know, the new building construction has not begun. It is not before us today. What is before us is, the reconstruction, the increasing the scope of the reconstruction of the front facade. So we had previously approved reconstructing the portions of the rear facade that hadn't already been removed historically, which had been the case at the ground floor anyway. And then the uh, replacing the re removing the outer wife of brick on the front facade and reusing the salvageable brick, salvageable brick. and the proposal um, now, given the DOB's executive order, uh, emergency order, excuse me, is to um, you know, reconstruct these facades, the front facades, um, in keeping with the intent of the original approval. So is there anything else the applicants would like to say before we go to questions? Well, if I could make one additional comment, you, um, Valerie covered my first thought and Sarah, you covered my second. Um, you know, we, we value the, the debate surrounding these buildings. We think it's all uh, extraordinarily useful to have an open discussion about this kind of thing. Um, and we value the historic quality of these buildings enormously. Uh, the thing that I keep hearing that I, I think actually does a disservice to history is that we're talking about a set of townhouses. Uh, these buildings were townhouses um, during the early 1800s and they were completely and totally renovated uh, and, and gutted essentially in the early 1900s when stoops were removed, shutters were taken out, balconets were removed, all of the individual townhouse appurtenances, staircases, parlors, uh, holdings were completely and utterly changed. And the result was two buildings that became multiple dwellings with apartments facing front and back, one entrance, um, one egress stair, uh, and none of the existing um, remnants of the townhouses left in place. The uh, ground floors became commercial, extended into the back gardens, um, and the whole was completely reconfigured. This is in fact very much a characteristic of this particular district. The Kansas Fort Market Historic District is about change, enormous changes that have ripped through um, the building fabric and is part and parcel of 
um, the designation and, and the, the quality and spirit of this district. That's not to say that that uh, you know, requires and mandates reconstruction, simply to say this is a very complicated picture and it's not a simple picture. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Goldblum. Thank you. Um, forgive me if I, if I missed this and you said it. The uh, signage on the, the painted signage on the brick on the 14th Street building is now in a pile somewhere? Yes, correct. No, um, no. It, well, I mean, the, the brick, the individual in bricks. <laughs> yeah, they're stored carefully. In a nice, neat stack. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very it, good. It's all been documented and, and is all salvaged, saved in, um, you know, in the, the panel that it, it, it came off of, each individual. So, sign. in other words, if, if this commission said that, that it was our um, uh, request requirement that it be rebuilt, it could be done? using the original materials for the most part? Uh, yes and no. I um, mean, as uh, Ted has indicated, a number of the uh, sign, uh, the, those bricks, those painted bricks would be unsalvageable because of the nature of the backup construction. But um, yes, uh, uh, signage could be restored <laughs> to some degree. Great. And what is the condition of the party walls? That you this guys were proposing to remove some, but there was more of it there in the existing condition, have they been completely removed? No, um, the party walls uh, in their entirety remain as well as the rear wall <clears throat> and the big west wall. Are they currently Great. braced and structured and supported? Awesome, thank you very much. All right, Commissioner Shamir Barron. Um, it, this might have been said, but I'm I'm just wondering what um, do what have we uh, the commission or maybe um, the engineers who consulted or a conversation generally with the Department of Buildings? What have we learned from this process? Meaning, is there a, a sort of modification to the way that um, probes or Early demolition or considerations for new 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 structure in behind mm -hmm. existing. Have we learned some things that that can be applied in future conditions or contexts, or might have us rethink even this the next steps on this project? Um, I, I just don't know that we're that there's that that has happened that kind of. It, that kind yeah. of well, thank you, thank you, Adi, for bringing that up. And you know, in fact, at, at the, the point we are in the, with this project is that the DOB has ordered the dismantling of the facades, and with the exception of the the elements that I've described that are not dismantled, those portions are down, and they're seeking to put them back. But we have thought long and hard about what can have what can we learn from this. Um, and what can we learn from other house, uh, early row houses and, and in, uh, single family houses that we are fine uh, ourselves um, worrying about their condition, that we have some other buildings that are on our radar. We're working closely with the Department of Buildings to monitor those. Um, you know, I think that it doesn't happen often, but it, and it is quite rare, but there are, um, times when we are faced with very early buildings that have either by virtue of their kind of inherent construction techniques and method methods, or because of changes over time, um, have become vulnerable. And so we're working very closely with the Department of Buildings to figure out ways to identify those in advance so we can be more proactive. And then to think about how we review applications for some of those buildings that may be more vulnerable because of some of these factors. And so um, we're trying to figure out um, how we can make the most of this and, um, and gain the most amount of knowledge and expertise to facilitate 
uh, for the future applications and also just proactively looking at buildings. Um, we've started to reach out to other structural engineers as well for peer advice. So um, it's something that I think as a body, we will continue to study and explore um, as our landmarks are aging and to find ways that we can more proactively address structural conditions and protect them. Thanks. And just in terms of just to add a little bit more in terms of what we uh, is part of the learning, um, a set of things that we would require uh, applicants to um, provide or assure or um, right. Those yeah. are all things we're looking at. Yeah, we're looking at, you know, which certain um, features of a building potentially make it vulnerable and then what kinds of things we want to look for beyond what we already do when we look at applications and of course how we can coordinate more closely with the uh, structural experts expertise at DOB. Okay, Commissioner Chapin. Yeah, Sarah, uh, but pursuant to that, uh, the letter that's quoted in the presentation um, indicates that uh, it, there wasn't an indication that these conditions are the result of the recent work undertaken pursuant to the landmarks and Department of Buildings permits. That is correct. I mean, as was pointed out, uh, many of these conditions have existed, existed for decades and were uh, longstanding issues. So they were exposed by the, you know, proposed work, but they were not caused by the proposed work. Uh, so correct. To speak. It was only when the buildings were vacated and the finishes and interior partitions were removed that the full extent of the structural issues were exposed. I mean, there clearly had been uh, other uh, earlier knowledge that building repairs would be needed and base building repairs would have to be taken, uh, but I don't think the extent of that uh, uh, compromised structure was uh, known to anyone until uh, that initial demolition work was done. And I believe that it's DOB's opinion that this was actually fortunate that this was revealed and that this, had it not been revealed, could have been a very hazardous condition. Like those floor joists, for example. All right, for the occupied buildings. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Chair Carroll, may I make a point? Yes, please. This is Harry Kendall with BKSK. And I just wanted to point out that um, wh whereas we, the team did not understand the, the degree of damage that existed behind the, the finishes, we did understand the degree of reconstruction that was needed with the face brick. And this has been, we, we described this, but it's an unusual pro project where we would say going in um, that all the face brick has to be removed in order to be reinstalled. And, uh, you know, and our estimates about how much of it could be salvaged haven't really changed. So, um, so that's the point I wanna make that this is not, that this is still what what's being, built is from the exterior uh, as proposed in the C of A. Correct, and, and the previous C of A also included keeping portions of the party walls. And I think that the proposal would include, uh, your proposal also includes keeping those portions that may still be there or re rebuilding walls in those locations, correct? Correct, that's correct. Yeah. Okay, other questions? Here, Carol, can I just uh, address one Please. point that came up regarding yep. the painted, uh, wall sign? The commission in the past has uh, not required uh, buildings owner owners to keep necessarily painted wall oh. signs. Uh, obviously it creates confusion in terms of uh, who are the tenants in the buildings. Um, and it also would be uh, uh, blocked somewhat by the shutters that are being installed as part of the restoration. So uh, the condition is gonna be slightly different than uh, what was there when the, those paint wall signs were originally installed. I could just add to that. There's also a, a real question of um, how <clears throat> once the, the brick is cleaned, even though we're using very gentle um, 
uh, we use simple green actually to, to clean the 14th street um, and the 9th Avenue uh, brick uh, that were in that photograph. Um, but there's a real question how much of the uh, paint uh, will actually survive a, a cleaning no matter how mild we, uh, you know, and, and a cleaning solution we use. Okay. All right, any other questions or any other final comments? Okay, commissioners, I'm gonna to start to unmute you all or request to unmute you so we can move to close the hearing and begin our discussion. All right, Commissioner Jefferson, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So motion. Thank you. Commissioner Goldblum, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the hearing is closed. Um, and, you know, I, I, I do um, want to sort of set this up. I, I do first want to say that, you know, as, as I answered um, Commissioner Shamir Barron's question, this is something that we're very um, concerned about for all of our landmarks of this, of this age and period. And we are continuing to um, work closely with experts in the field, including our colleagues at the Department of Buildings to identify potentially vulnerable buildings, um, to think about ways that we can address them proactively, um, and then certainly how, how we review future applications and what kinds of things we need to look at. So lessons are uh, absolutely necessary here, and we're going to be taking steps to gain as much knowledge as we can from this experience. And, and where we are today is um, the, the facades have been dismantled uh, per the DOB order and the uh, proposal included already the reconstruction of the outer wise of the brick and the, uh, the applicants are seeking now to reconstruct the facades as they were originally intended uh, and as part of this, um, as part of the earlier approval. So um, I know that there's you know, a lot of concern about the process and the condition, but I, I, I do want us to focus our discussion. I think we are um, actively, just wanna assure you, we're actively working on identifying vulnerable buildings, um, but we are faced with an application today uh, to reconstruct these facades. So if we can focus on that, that would be great. Um, Commissioner Bland, would you like to start? No, but I do. <laughs> I find this to be very, very, very difficult, if not one of the more difficult situations I've had to face in my time as a commissioner. Uh, on one hand, I know that we've approved uh, reconstructions from time to time. <clears throat> and for this sort of a reason, it's not something we want to do ever, of course. It's also uh, true that for 30 years, I parked my car on College Place in Brooklyn Heights in a, in a little carriage house that I don't know the, the previous history of why it was impossible to save that front facade. It was only like 20, 22 feet wide and two stories tall. But nonetheless, there's a plaque that says it was reconstructed and all brand new. And certainly it was you know, it's okay, fit in, it, it, but it was not real. It was not the real thing. It was, a, it was a facsimile. And I think the facsimile issue uh, strikes at the heart of, uh, uh, of, of what landmarks and preservation is about. Otherwise we can go to Disneyland and so forth and see all sorts of cute things. Um, you know, I appreciated all the, uh, the testimony. I want to go on record personally, though, as saying that I don't view what's happened to be nefarious in any way. It's just, it, it is what it is. I don't think it was nefarious, as was perhaps suggested in a little bit of the testimony. I just can't see it that way. Um, but, but one of the testimonies, uh, sang out to me a little bit more, and that was HDC, although they didn't really use uh, 
in a technical bank, but they testified in a very technical way uh, that the various wives of brick could be saved, et cetera, et cetera, and almost gave a recipe. Um, as much as I respect them, it wasn't a, it wasn't from a technical person that was saying that. It was a, it was a, you know, the spokesperson for HDC. But it still stuck with me that is it possible, even notwithstanding what uh, DOB and their excellent engineers have said to save the front facade? Is it not possible? But Fred, and, it's, it's, can I say it's already dismantled? So okay. what's, it's already done. Gone. Right. So I'm what's, so what's there is, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't get that. So what's there now is the cast iron, historic okay. cast iron fabric at the ground floor is there and will remain. Right. Okay. Some of the foundations will remain. Some of the party walls will remain. Other oh. portions of the party walls will be recreated as was originally approved. Okay, well then then my my point is, I, I somehow missed that part in all of that. <laughs> on all of it, I missed that. So uh, strike that. Um, I was gonna suggest that this was um, Monticello or, uh, something like that, you know, we'd figure out a way of saving it, but it's gone. So it's gone. So what are we going to do? Tear the whole thing down, start all over and have a brand new building there. I don't think so. I, I don't think so. I can't cast myself in that, uh, in that position. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think uh, therefore the replacement as has been suggested and has been supported by the Landmarks Conservancy with whom I, uh, agree a lot and have great respect for that using, as was suggested here, uh, in, in great detail using and monitored by the staff, even though the staff now is under assault because of lack of attention, I don't, I don't buy that either. Um, but by great attention to the staff, the reusing of as much material as possible uh, in the reconstruction of these buildings, that is the right approach. I was about to say, because I didn't understand that critical thing, thank you for- Yeah, for, yeah for I think it, it wasn't that, clear in all of the testimony. Okay, yet. well, it may, I just, my mind got fogged, but um, uh, <clears throat> I, I suggest that we hold back and, you know, and, and re-look at it. So, but if that's, if it's gone, it's gone and it should be rebuilt oh. using as much of the, of the existing material Do whatever as possible. That, okay. That's my point of view. All right, great, thank you. And I think you know, and the the question about facsimile is a is a good one. And I think um, you know we struggle with it. We want to have integrity and in historic fabric. Um, on the other hand, we have been faced with buildings with compromised facades, and I think we have seen reconstruction as a valid uh, rest, approach to restoration when uh, there's no other option. We have, and I want to go. Want to say one more thing. Uh, the the uh, uh, community board had a great proposal, which I would support wholeheartedly, that this be documented uh, in, a, in, a, in an appropriate way with an exhibit or not just a plaque perhaps, but something more than that to show the history, how it's changed over time, way before it was ever a landmark, by the way, and how it's changed over time at time and time and time. So I think, I think we have to preserve that history in a really palpable way, not something that you have to look up in a book, but something you can read as you walk by. Great, thank you. Commissioner um, Holford-Smith. Oh, yes. Well, obviously this is a not where we wanna be with this. Um, it's really a tragic loss that all of this historic fabric has come down. Um, but I do believe that reconstruction is appropriate um, I think, you know, I'm not an expert in brick construction or restoration, but it's not unusual for party walls to be disengaged from face, face walls, uh, you know, front walls. Nor is it uncommon for face brick to disengage from the backup brick. So in a way, there are, these are conditions that are, are known in old buildings. And I, I do think that we need to put something, some a more rigorous procedure in place there's a whole host of non-destructive testing you can do. Uh, there are experts out there. I see GMS is on this call. There are experts in this. Walter Melvin's office are experts in this. Um, I think maybe when you come to a project like this where you, you may suspect that 
you know, building has been altered heavily over the years, that you don't just go in there and start demoing everything, that you do more carefully. And I think if that had been done, then this facade may have been salvaged. You know, I think when the, by the time DOB got there, there was probably so much lath and connective tissue that was holding that wall together that had been removed that it was too late. And at that point, it would have been surgical to, re to repair it, which you still could have probably done, but it would have been surgery and it would have been you know, taking a lot of care, a lot of money, a lot of time. And I'm sure DOB didn't want to you know, leave that to a mason who they may not know have had that skill, rather than you know risk the fact that it could fall to the street. So I think this is all very regrettable and um, could have been prevented. And I think and if we could definitely use this as a teaching um, opportunity for everyone involved. But I, I vote for reconstruction. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Devonshire. Thank. You. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I regrettable is a is a kind way to, to put this. Frankly, um, I agree with a, a lot of what Anna is saying. That, you know, it, it's not as if historic buildings are some new entity for us. Anybody who's in this business or has been in this business for more than ten years knows how these buildings are are put together, and and they're just there were a few things in the in this presentation that really don't totally ring true for me. I'm not going to say that there are nefarious reasons for why this happened, um, but when when you tell me that the party was in okay condition, but then you tell me that the the floor joists um, are not attached to the party walls. Uh, make any sense because floor joists go from party wall to party wall. They don't go to the front or the rear side. Nevertheless, um, call them mistakes, but mistakes were made here from, from the get-go. If, if you're about to purchase a, an historic building, you have a structural assessment done of it. If, if you're smart, um, and I can only assume that the developer would be aware of a ton of money into buildings that are over 150 years old. Then um, it, it was meant an architect did the probes. Well, when, when our firm goes after a building, we hire a structural engineer. We, we review the probes, but we have a structural engineer um, come in and evaluate the probes. We don't do it. So there were, there were so many opportunities before this became an emergency for this to be rectified, for this to be at least and, and possibly rectified. And so what I want to say is I can approve the reconstruction, but in doing that, I would be saying it, it's okay for us to go on um, status quo, the way things are. Even if we learn things from this particular project, who knows? when the knowledge that we get from this is going to be put into action. It could be a year, it could be six months, it could be five years, nobody knows. And so for me to, to approve this would be to say, I'm okay with things as they are. And so I have to deny it. Uh, okay, uh, all right. I mean, I, I think that um, we, I, I, respect your decision. I just wanted you to understand that we are working on um, researching and understanding not just what happened here, but other buildings of this period and what the vulnerabilities are and how we can implement processes that protect them through our application process and working with DOB on the sort of larger universe. So I, I do want to assure you and that we're going to be working on that. Appreciate but. that, but at this point, at this point, any developer who enters into a, a situation like this can get a half bay inspection of his building and and proceed. And and quite honestly, I have had clients say to me, "This is what I would like for you to say." And whenever that happens, we've said no. Okay. Like I said, I'm not going to say that there's anything nefarious, 
but they're from so many sides. And, and as I said, I, I love the fact that we're going to learn from this, but at this point in time, any developer can say, oh, okay, that's the way I'm going to do my buildings. Well, if I could just uh, say something briefly, Sarah. I mean, Ms. Uh, Commissioner Devonshire, we already are implementing changes. I mean, we are now, the staff is alerted to applications where they think there might be issues, and we are referring those out to a structural engineer to get an opinion on whether we need additional information uh, to move forward with an application. So we already are taking steps uh, because of what's, what happened here. And implementing checklists for buildings of certain age and certain levels of alterations um, that applicants must go through that require more submission materials and oversight from an, our own structural engineer as well as DOB. So we are implementing those, but I'm also wondering if you're denying the reconstruction of the facades, I'm just wondering what, what would happen on this site then? Okay. I'm sure I'm in the minority here, so it's not okay. going to mean anything. Okay, it's sort of on one way or another to change my opinion. What I what the the bigger picture for me is is the the the, the bigger picture. Okay, not this particular. Okay. All right, Commissioner Chapin. Yeah. Um, well, uh, obviously, this is, you know, a, a troubling event that has happened. And, you know, I, I spent some years at Department of Buildings, and obviously, vulnerabilities are not always evident without cracking the facade or leaning of the walls uh, when work starts to commence on a building. And I don't, I'm not a structural engineer and I am uh, not uh, doing preservation work as, as uh, Commissioner Devonshire is. So I only could depend on our council's, uh, you know, report earlier that, and that, that this, what happened did not result from the work being conducted, but what was uncovered by it, which is, quite a difference, you know. So, uh, you know, these things obviously are the result of long-term deterioration that we're, that is not always evident, you know, and, and not always, and not necessarily the respons responsibility of the current developer as far as that goes, which is another issue. So, uh, At this point, I, I'm I'm not convinced, uh, as others may be, that it could have been prevented if we it, if someone had discovered. So the, the question is that it might have had to it might have had to have have significant demolition uh, if if somebody wanted to do anything at this site, and if they didn't do anything at this site, we could have had a collapse. It mm -hmm. sounds like I'm. But I don't, I can't, without a real forensic investigation, I, I'm, I'm not sure what the situation is. What I do know, obviously, is we are now in a situation where we don't, we don't have, uh, you know, we have to restore the building in some fashion. And uh, I'm kind of with Commissioner Bland, which is uh, we need to preserve as many party walls as we can. We need to preserve uh, as much of the, uh, historic material as possible for the reconstruction purposes. And uh, obviously also, yes, we should take every action we can to make sure that as we proceed with any uh, building, any work on any building, that the work itself does not endanger the building. And if the building isn't, may be endangered by it, if we can, to the degree possible, we need to discover that and then decide, okay, what's what's going to happen? Uh, is the building does the building need some immediate action, and that may result in demolition, or does it not? You know, and, and so on. So those are, are all questions. I understand that uh, the staff and the, the the council's office are pursuing with the Department of Buildings. I'm sure working with them as well. Anyway, so my my position is we should. Uh, we should authorize 
reconstruction uh, with the uh, materials available and preserving as much as we can of uh, the fabric and any structures that are structurally stable and or can be stabilized. So that's that's my okay. Position. Great, Commissioner Luffy. Thanks, Sarah. Um, you know, I'm of course in agreement with everybody that the situation is uh, yeah, it's more than unfortunate. It's uh, sort of disappointing. It's, it's something we want to prevent ha from happening in the future. And sometimes these things happen and it, what they, when things like this happen and they haven't been taken into account um, as part of a process, a preservation, redevelopment, restoration process, we all have to pause and reassess what went wrong, what could have been done, um, and what are we going to do now? We have to do something now, and we have to do something going forward. So first, I'm very heartened by the fact that the applicant has come to us in earnest to try to resolve this in a way that makes sense. And number two, that the commission has not tried to, um, you know, push this away, but embrace this in a way so that we can learn from it. And as we move forward with other projects like this, we're more proactive. And in being more proactive, we can hopefully um, prevent this kind of situation from happening in the future. That's all positive. And as I said, sometimes you don't get to that point until unfortunate, unfortunately a situation like this unfolds. So I am um, happy that we're in this place um, even though it's a double-edged sword here, but I'm happy because I know the agency is, and I feel comfortable in the approach that the agency is going to try to take with sister agencies to uh, deal with this in the future. I, I agree that the thing to do right now is to authorize the work to move forward. And I think it is very, very important that the applicant work very, very closely with staff on salvageability of the original material, the bricks, um, to see what party walls can be saved, to see the reconstruction, how the new brick and the old brick are gonna be integrated together in a way that makes sense, um, so that the so that the the project ultimately benefits. I also agree. I like. Uh, I'm on board with this idea of preserving to the best, uh, you know, of of the our ability and the applicant's ability to to preserve those uh, the signage walls and to document them and to see if there's a way to somehow incorporate something about them somewhere in this project so that um, people coming to the site in whatever format can have a better understanding of what was here. Okay, great, thank you. Commissioner Goldblum. Okay. <laughs> very interesting conversation, very sad situation. For me, I, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm less focused personally on the perfidies or potential perfidies of, of the past and more on the potential for what we should do now. And I think that the first thing that I come away with 
in the, in the self-flagellating department is that I totally missed the fact that this was gonna be a totally reskinned building to begin with. And the issue that Fred raised about Disneyfication and, and facadism that one of the uh, uh, testimony uh, uh, raised, it was already a done deal, it was baked in. And so the fact is here that we're debating not the, the, the aesthetic, uh, an aesthetic change of one iota to the approved uh, uh, design, but rather a modification of the structure supporting that totally new or totally rebuilt facade. And the crisis here for me is not that, that um, uh, those inner wythes of brick have proven to be unstable and therefore needed to be removed and therefore the facade needed to be removed because the parts we were gonna see were gonna be removed anyway, <clears throat> but rather it goes to the other imperative of what we do here, right? We do how it looks from the street and we do historic material. Those are kind of the two big things. Um, and what this is, is this is a crime against historic material because the historic material, even though we're salvaging the bricks, the units, the building is in large measure gone and will have to be rebuilt. So what that tells me to do today is yes, I would totally approve the reconstruction of the facade. However, I would do so in a way that maximized the retention of extant historic material. One, in terms of the replacement of the bricks, like Jeannie was saying, I think it might be worth considering not only putting back the sign on the, on the corner building, irrespective of the shutters, either we take off the shutters or, or we leave them on and have them over the sign. <clears throat> but I think you've got to put back here whatever it is that isn't fake or that isn't ersatz or that isn't rebuilt or, you know, it's going to be rebuilt, but that isn't, you know, that's old, <laughs> that's real, and that communicates its historicity. Um, and I think that the, the signs do that, and if that means not power washing them, then don't power wash them. If that means not green, green washing them, don't green wash them. Just put them back. Make sure that the joint sizes and the joint composition is, is commensurate with the historic. Make sure that the details are, you know, make sure that we're salvaging every piece we can salvage. And in terms of what Jeannie was saying, you know, I think that their aesthetic approach of weaving in the old and the new brick makes sense. However, if we're trying to maximize historicity, it may be better to rebuild in total a number of the former individual units and have all the new bricks segregated off to one side. I don't know. That's, that's a kind of aesthetics versus historic truth question that I think can be debated. And I'd, I'd love to get the staff's input and you know, those who know these things better than I do. But I think that there's an argument to be made here that if the whole damn thing is being rebuilt, let's rebuild it such that there's as much historic material as, as possible together. And so that it's not an, a Disney uh, presentation. Also to that point, my recollection of the application of which I was not a fan at the time was that there was too much of the interior brick uh, part, party walls being removed. Let's make sure that the amount of brick party wall is retained as much as possible in its current today configuration. My recollection was that they were removing large quantities on the first floor and uh, lesser quantities, but still significant quantities up above to make for a more uniform situation. Frankly, uniformity is not something that I would consider to be an essential historic preservation uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, ideal. I think that if we're trying to preserve the buildings and the parts of the buildings that are left are the party walls, we should seriously consider preserving as much of them as we can. Um, <clears throat> and uh, that also goes for things like lintels or uh, any elements. You know, I, I think we should be aiming here not for a beautiful reconstruction, but for a historic reassembly to the greatest degree possible and a compensatory preservation of things that we maybe last time didn't focus on as much because now we realize how precious the artifact is and how we have lost a major component of the artifact. Therefore, we should hold on to as much of the artifact that's left as we can. 
Okay, thank you. And and I do think that, you know, since this has happened, the staff has worked with them to do extremely detailed drawings and understand the amount of bricks salvageable. So I think the intent is to keep and reuse as, as much brick as is uh, feasible. And um, so I think the question of whether you aggregate it in one place or sweep it through out the facades is a really good question, but probably needs to be thought about down the road in the future when we understand how much we're actually dealing with. But thank you for that. Um, okay, Commissioner Shamir Barron. Thanks. Um, uh, Chair Carroll, can you clarify for me, because I think I'm a little bit confused about whether on in May, did we actually um, approve the um, the alter the application to replace the front facade as well as the um, general scope of the of the new construction the new building behind or did we only only uh, focus on the front facade were those two things separate or together no, it was single application yeah. um, much of the new building is actually off the landmark site outside of the district and some of it sits on the landmark site and at the time we reviewed the modifications to the rear facade where it would make connections we also reviewed the restoration plan which included removing the dormers doing the new chimney vents um, and taking off the outer wide of the brick and turning the back, turning them around and saving as much as was possible and doing, uh, saving the cast iron piers at the ground floor and doing new storefront infill. The cast iron piers are still there and keeping the front and rear portions of the uh, party walls and, and some party walls in their entirety. Okay, so I, um... I think that clarifies it for me. So I'll say that I am in agreement with um, with others, but especially um, Commissioner Holford Smith and uh, to in, uh, even a further uh, Commissioner Goldblum about this kind of the need for reconstruction and then the really kind of rethinking about what reconstruction is, reassembly, as Commissioner Goldblum I, I think used the word or, or another word similar to that. Um, and the really thinking about reconstituting the stuff that was there to the greatest extent possible. But I, uh, so I'm in agreement with that and to the extent that this is what is before us today, uh, I, I can find that appropriate. I do though think that if in fact, what we're doing now is we are decoupling um, these two things, the, the restoration piece from the, the, the kind of the new, const the new construction and new building um, and approvals there, then we should decouple it uh, formally, if actually in, in that we should see that, that, that proposal, which was previously contingent or, or together with this one again. And in other words, now, I don't know if that's an issue of voiding a previous approval for the new building behind or, or what that actually means, but I, I, I think we need to sort of begin again. And, um, and so part of that beginning again is in my mind, the dealing with what we've got here in terms of the historic building and committing to its reconstruction at the kind of, at the, at the deepest and at the most meaningful level. But then also it means that some of the decisions that were made previously, the contextual decisions, the new construction decisions need to be rehashed and reconsidered after this thing is um, reconciled and, and, and completed. Okay. So uh, my feeling is it, that needs to be dealt with and, um, and pulled apart further. Okay, so the application is not technically pulled apart. It is, it's not decoupled. This is one approval that we, we had one approval and this is, this is essentially an amendment to uh, increase the scope of the re re uh, reconstruction work on the front facade. Well, but but that's not how the thing kind of reads, right? I mean, uh, or I, as I, you know, in terms of what we approve today, um, it, it, insofar as it, as it um, 
as it affirms the need for reconstruction, it, one could say that it might not be um, related or, or together with the, as it was in the previous application when this was less of, a, of, a, uh, of an issue that we needed to consider or that we needed to get right. All right, so I, you know, I don't know where that leaves you on the decision today because it is one application, um, and the intent uh, by the applicants today is that the end result will be in keeping with the intent of the original approval. We are actually now talking about really digging down and and uh, enhancing the retention of historic fabric beyond what was uh, maybe considered last time. So. Um, We'd be pushing yes. it further, but not decoupling it. Yeah, that, so, so I really do have a problem, I guess, with that, because I am in full support of the reconstruction, um, the, the, the knowledge that's gained from it, the need to do it. But I also think that, there, that something new has happened here, which, is, which should call into question or, or needs to have a kind of a hard stop on one aspect of this. And that one aspect is that are, are the, some of the sort of the assumptions and the considerations that we that we used and and, and debated earlier seem to need for a, a, a restudy at a further at a later date. But that so I don't know really what I'm to do since okay. it's not a couple. So thanks. Okay. All right. All right. So we'll let's continue um, and see where we are. Commissioner Jefferson. <clears throat> I'm for replication, but what replication? How are we gonna do that? And I, I think since we're saving 60% of the existing brick, how that's distributed across this facade, that's the issue for me. How do we do that? And how do you plan it out? And how does the staff think about it? And that's, that's the, the crux to me of the restoration process. Okay, and that is so that will be something that will be ongoing, you know, today, I think we would do it conceptually and we would have to continue those explorations. Okay, yes. Commissioner Chen. Very interesting discussion. Um, love to hear the comments from all the commissioners. Uh, you know, the, the uh, anecdotally, I can tell you that um, I was visiting a potential landmark building um, uh, a few years back, uh, a very famous case, uh, prior commission was uh, trying to designate that building. And it turns out the whole facade was like the, if you ever remember the old series, the $6 million man, where every part was reconstructed and patched together. And, and to C Commissioner Goldblum's point about that, uh, that was what the outside world and the preservation community and the commission was fixated on. And we went there with the expert and looking at the facade and it was all incorrectly put together. And yet that was what the Hollywood facade stands for the preservation, which is that, um, you know, the, the, the bonding was incorrectly put back together. Uh, the courses was wrong. The, uh, the, the balcony was uh, uh, incorrectly put. And yet what was really worth preserving are the side walls. The side walls were solid and no one was paying to, to, uh, to the attention to the sidewall. And as we were standing there, this perfectly solid sidewall, the brick popped out in the middle of nowhere. Just like <laughs> the water joints was in place and the brick popped out just while we were standing there. No one was doing anything touching the wall. And that is the dilemma for us. You know, we always talked about beauty being skin deep. And yet we are drawn to that so-called facade, right, facadism. And so I think that the, uh, the, the lesson for me here is now what, right? Um, the, the old walls are gone, the, uh, the, uh, the bricks are here. And, and Commissioner Goldblum uh, raised an interesting point. Should we just reconstruct a part so that as much as possible, concentrate all the brick and, and to Commissioner uh, Jefferson's point is, it, do you want to concentrate on taking all the brick that we have the 60% into one portion or do we scatter to it uh, uh, that these are the material? And so to me is like, um, uh, is it, 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 it's, it's quite obvious that we can't go back. The, 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 
the, the facade is gone. And, and so the question is now what? So I, I do think that we should have, I'm glad to hear that the commission is really in for uh, gradually uh, and working with DOB. And I don't think even DOB to Diana's point that you could have foreseen that this brick will pop out in the middle of the brick. I mean, it's, it's just the wall is solid. Uh, and, and so I think that the recommendation should be that we should salvage as much as possible and have the staff work very closely and really start going out as well to look at, you know, potentially fragile buildings that may be masonry uh, that is in jeopardy. But again, sometimes it's in God's work. I mean, I, I, I can't say, but I do. I do think that, um, you know, the, for us, the, our hands are, are the, the choice is quite obvious today. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So um, I think that I've covered everybody. And um, I think where we are is we have uh, enough to vote to approve the reconstruction um, with the condition that, as always, that they work very, very closely with the staff as they have been and continue, well, should continue to do so to, um, to, uh, to verify um, the amount of historic fabric that can be reused um, and to, you know, to try to uh, salvage as much as is possible, even more than they anticipate at this point, if that's possible. Um, we have been assured by DOB, I think that, that we can get very close uh, mortar joints on like some new construction. So I think we are gonna be monitoring that as well. So to work closely with the staff on the extent of historic fabric that can be salvaged and how it's executed um, to be as close to the original as possible. Um, and uh, also to continue to explore the uh, extent of the party wall uh, replacement. Uh, Commissioner Goldblum, would you make that motion? Okay. <laughs> Hold on. I mean, the problem is that I didn't vote for this in the first place. So okay. I might so, not be the best guy to do that. I was not fine. a fan of the, since it is not being decoupled, I was opposed to the tower. Okay, no, fair enough. That's a good point. Commissioner Latfi, would you make the motion? Yes, hold on one second. I now have to find my... <laughs> <laughs> um, I had thought of you because we we're sort of going with your suggestions, um, but we'll uh, we'll do those suggestions anyway. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oof. Okay. In the matter of docket twenty two dash zero six one three three forty four dash fifty four Ninth Avenue and 351-355 West 14th Street, Gansport Market Historic District, a row of Greek revival. So row houses and stores built in circa 1845-46 and a row of Greek revival style townhouses with stores built in circa 1844 to 42 to 44. The application is to reconstruct facades. I know that the building style, scale, materials, and details are among the features <clears throat> that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Gansworth Market his Historic District. I also note that the other aspects of the previously approved larger project for these two sets of buildings, including the details of the proposed windows, cornices, storefronts, and sign band, band reinstallation re of the balcony, and shutters at the Ninth Avenue buildings, the retention of portions of the party walls and the recreation of the form of the prominent historic chimneys at the Ninth Avenue buildings and form and materials of the chimneys at the West 14th Street buildings are consistent with the prior approval. I recommend approval with modifications finding that the facades of the 9th Avenue and West 14th Street buildings were demolished in compliance with the Department of Buildings emergency orders due to deteriorated and unsafe conditions uncovered during construction. That the facades were documented with laser scans prior to their demolition 
thereby ensuring the reconstruction <clears throat> is as accurate and authentic as possible. That the reconstructed brick facades will be built to match their existing design dimensions, details, and placement utilizing three wide construction that the brick throughout the facades was salvaged and the cast iron piers at the base of the building remain in place. Therefore, the maximum amount of historic material feasible will be reused in the reconstruction that no expansion joints, metal relieving angles or plastic weep tubes will be incorporated as part of the reconstruction work and that the work will support the long-term preservation of the building and that the, and that the work will result in the fulfillment of the design intent of the prior approval and will not detract from the special <clears throat> architectural and historic character of the Gansborough Market Historic District. However, I find that the juxtaposition of the new and salvaged brick in uh, reconstruction projects can often draw undue attention to the new brick, if not a perfect match and can detract from the overall appearance of the reconstructed building. Therefore, I recommend that the applicant continue to study the best combination and placement of the salvaged and new bricks in the reconstruction uh, work in very close consultation with staff and that the uh, applicant look for an opportunity to incorporate uh, some of the uncovered uh, brick that early, denoted earlier uh, signage on the building to figure out um, how to incorporate it in some way into the project uh, so that it tells the history uh, of what this built, what these buildings were all about. All right, and that they continue to work with the staff to ensure that the greatest amount of historic fabric can be salvaged. Okay, Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Yes, sir. That's going to include the party walls as well, right? Yes. Okay. I second that motion. Okay. Thank you. And John, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Uh, Commissioner Bland? Aye. 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 Commissioner Barron? Uh, I <laughs> wait. <laughs> I would, um, I think I may need to abstain or vote no if, in fact, um, the tower approval cannot be decoupled from this. <coughs> okay, so that so, says no. Okay. Uh, no abstention. Uh, you can abstain if you want. Uh, Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? No. Commissioner Goldblum? I'm going to vote no because of my earlier vote. Not, be, not because of the, the particular matters that are associated with this amendment, but because the amendment is linked to the earlier approval, I'm gonna vote no. Uh, Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. Commissioner Holford-Smith? Aye. Seven in favor, two opposed and one abstention, the motion passes. That we will continue to work very, very closely with this uh, project team and uh, work on all of the details moving forward and thinking about the placement of the salvaged brick um, and all of the other details. And, and we are also, as I said, going to continue to think about uh, policy and practices that we can implement to uh, based on lessons that we learn here, as well as uh, working with experts in the field, uh, studying all vulnerable buildings. All right, so thank you. Um, and uh, this is approved. Uh, so please continue to work with the staff. And that concludes our public hearing today. Thank you all for your incredibly hard work. Thank you. Thank you all.